believe that the 71,000 people who are, are registered uh, in Scotland with the GTCS do so too. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Angela Constance on developing Scotland's young workforce. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. And I'll just give a few moments for the front benches to get themselves settled. And I'll call on Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to set out the Government's initial response to the final report of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, which Serene Wood presented to me earlier this month. It is a report which I fully welcome and whose ambitions for young people employment and prosperity in Scotland uh, I share without exception. I know we all support the positive vision for Scotland's young people evident throughout the report and I want to put on record my thanks to Sir Ian, the Commission and all who contributed to their work for presenting such insightful, pragmatic and clear recommendations. When we asked Sir Ian to lead this work some 18 months ago, this Government was anticipating uh, the need to address youth unemployment in the context of a more uh, positive economic outlook. We presented the Commission with an extremely challenging remit. We asked it to explore how we might develop a modern, responsive and valued vocational training system and emulate the labour markets of the best performing European countries. And recognising the need to make the most effective use uh, of the skills of all our young women and men, I asked the Commission to consider in particular how all young people can benefit from education and employment regardless of gender, ethnicity or disability. And I was delighted to receive the report and its 39 recommendations. They represent a coherent, practical and powerful set of ideas about what more needs to be done to align our education system firmly and for the long term with the needs of the economy. The report's treatise for further change and improvement is inarguable in my view and that is why today we are embarking on a campaign to develop Scotland's young workforce, taking the report's recommendations as a starting point. Our ambitions for economic growth will not be realised without higher levels of employment amongst young people, <coughs> recognising the scale of our ambitions and the radical reduction required if we are to reduce youth unemployment to amongst the lowest in Europe. The Scottish Government's goal is to reduce youth unemployment in Scotland by 40% by 2020. Today, I will set out what this Government will do to take immediate action uh, on all the young workforce and work towards this goal, and I will return to the role of our partners later. As Serene himself said, developing the young workforce demands a culture change from all parts of the education and training system, and from employers, young people, and those who influence young people over the medium term. We have world-class higher education in Scotland and Scotland's young people deserve a vocational education offer of the same quality and value. The report recognises that this government's education, training and employment policies and programmes, including curriculum for excellence, college reform and employer support measures, have established the right platform to create a world-class vocational education system in Scotland, valued by and valuable to our young people. As the Commission's report says, the introduction of curriculum for excellence in primary schools and in S1 to S3 is already making a difference as a new approach to teaching and learning is helping pupils to develop many of the skills and attributes they will need to be successful in their working lives. Of course, there is more that we can and will do now to act on the report. A key feature of a world-leading vocational education system is one that is shaped by employers and meets the needs of industry. So I can announce today that I will make an initial £1 million available for the establishment of industry-led Invest in Young People groups, which will make the crucial links between employers and education that will in turn improve opportunities for young people. And we will work with local authorities and other partners to develop these groups. Key to the successful implementation will be a strong and committed employer leadership. To achieve this, we will look to work with a number of established groups, such as those highlighted by the Commission in Glasgow, Renfrewshire and Edinburgh. And in those parts of the country where such groups don't already exist, we will work with local employers to support the establishment of new groups in partnership with existing organisation and service providers. 
I am in full agreement with the report that employers should be publicly recognised for the contribution they make to develop in Scotland's young workforce. The Government is working with investors and people uh, to develop an Invest in Young People Award, and I expect this to be in place soon. I now want to turn to how we will further develop training opportunities for Scotland's young women and men. Our modern apprenticeship programme stands out as an exemplar of an employment-based vocational training offer. And I want to see it expand, flex and focus to help us achieve more for our economy and for all of our young men and women. This government has already committed to creating more ME opportunities by expanding the programme to 30,000 starts each year by 2020. And today I can announce further improvements to the modern apprenticeship programme, building on the recommendations from the Commission's report. Presiding officer, I can announce that as we work with Skills Development Scotland to implement our expansion plans, we will deliver the recommendation that the report makes around modern apprenticeships. This will include offering more higher level MEs and developing pilots for advanced apprenticeships, including to graduate level, encouraging more MEs in the critical STEM subject areas. I will also look to SDS to begin pilots for foundation apprenticeships. These will see SDS work closely with schools and colleges to develop more structured pathways from the senior phase of schools where young people will be able to combine their general education with elements of work-based learning. These will provide a more practical grounding which will help prepare young people for future apprenticeships, employment or further study. And I am pleased to announce today that the first pilot of a foundation apprenticeship will begin in partnership with Fife College in August this year for school pupils studying engineering. This is a, an exciting development and one which will see that the principles of this report made real for a number of young people in the coming months. The campaign to develop Scotland's young workforce is also a, a hearts and minds campaign to transform the view of what vocational education offers in terms of engaging learning and desirable employment prospects. Young people and those who guide them should have access to high quality and current advice about the labour market and routes into that. Better careers guidance tools will be developed to inform young people and their parents about the future labour market opportunities and the skills they need in line with the report's recommendations. So SDS, working with Education Scotland, local authorities, the unions and importantly employers will develop services designed to inspire and challenge young people's career aspirations informed by labour market intelligence. The final area I wish to address is that of equality. I was keen that the Commission's work should explore in depth the issues around access to vocational opportunities. I believe that the report delivers this with an ambitious set of recommendations which have been widely welcomed by a number of equality groups. Everyone in this chamber should acknowledge the disappointing figures on equality contained in the Commission's report, despite making significant progress on increasing the proportion of women benefiting from the ME programme from 27% to 41%. It is clear that tackling occupational segregation eh, must remain a vital priority. And the report recognises the difficulty in changing the perceptions and culture that can drive the behaviours of young people and employers. And to make progress, we must develop coherent approaches which look at all stages of the pathways to work. Across these approaches, I have asked to see renewed focus on the needs of different young people, particularly those that face the greatest disadvantage and barriers to good training and work. So we will work quickly with Skills Development Scotland and those expert groups to develop action plans which build on the good work that is already happening. I can confirm today that I expect Skills Development Scotland to lead work to improve opportunities for those groups currently underrepresented in the ME programme. This will include encouraging young women and men to consider career options in non-traditional sectors and supporting careers, coaches, parents, carers and teachers to help challenge and break down gender and cultural stereotypes. It is important that Skills Development Scotland develop specific plans to address the gender balance on certain frameworks and to help increase participation by minority ethnic young people, young people with disability and also care leavers. And these action plans will help to ensure that all young people can secure real and lasting equality of opportunity. In very large part, achieving our ambitions for young people is about focusing our existing resources in the most effective way. However, to help kickstart this important activity, I am allocating an additional £3 million 
to Skills Development Scotland to take this work on modern apprenticeships, careers and equality forward with immediate effect. And Education Scotland will also receive an additional half million pounds to support action on developing the young workforce. From the basis of these early actions, this government will lead a concerted effort jointly with local government to develop Scotland's young workforce. As ever, early intervention is crucial, and this means action that is very often focused on young people who are still in the school system. So for this reason, the development of Scotland's young workforce will be a joint endeavour between us and partners and local government. There are many partners, presiding officer, involved in acting on the report's recommendations, in particular local government, and the government will work in partnership with COSLA eh, over the coming weeks to plan for implementation. Together, we will develop curtailed plans, eh, detailed plans over the summer, which we will publish in the autumn of 2015-16, eh, as our 2015-16 budget plans are set out. Maybe I'll just recapitulate that again, presiding officer, so that we're clear for, for chamber. Uh, the Scottish Government, together with our partners, will develop very detailed plans over the summer, which we will publish in the autumn as we move forward with our plans to develop our 2015-16 uh, budget plans. We have already made clear that the resource implications of this effort will be taken into consideration in the development of our budget. And I very much look forward to sharing these developments with Parliament uh, over the coming months. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary should press the request bu speak button now. And I call Jane Imala, who will be followed by Mary Scanlon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement on the important Wood Commission report today. Um, and we also welcome her announcement that she will be making uh, detailed plans over the summer, and I look forward to debating them with her um, after recess. I have met with Sir Ian Wood, presiding officer, since the publication of the report and want to also put on, on record our thanks in the Labour Party, our thanks to him and the members of his commission for their work and commitment to youth employment, one of the most critical problems in our communities today. And there, there is much in this report that we welcome the renewed focus and rehabilitation of vocational training, no longer to be seen in Scotland as the Cinderella option, but taking its rightful place as skilled, valued and a respected and prosperous option for young people planning their work and their careers. And building towards this, I particularly like Sir Ian's recommendations for more work experience for school pupils and more um, intense relationships between schools and colleges. Now, presiding officer, by the Scottish Government's own figures, they say that youth employment has fallen by 25% since the Cabinet Secretary was appointed, which leads me to ask her why we have such a modest reduction target of 40% by 2020, if she would expect 25% um, um, increase anyway. Why then just um, supplement that by 15%? Uh, it seems to me to be quite modest, and we should be looking to eradicate um, youth employment. But also, and the final point, is our colleges. These recommendations are underpinned by the success of our colleges. We've had many debates in here as to the underfunding of our colleges. The uh, Cabinet Secretary pledged £12 million on the publication of this report. I only see £4 million allocated today. So can she tell me if the rest of that money will be spent in our colleges? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I thank Ms Mara for her supportive comments and particularly uh, with respect to her comments about the value and importance of vocational training. Um, it is um, imperative uh, for the future of our young people but also to the future of our economy uh, that in tandem with our world-class higher education system that we have uh, a world-class vocational training system. And the reason for that is what we've learned from other uh, European countries. The European countries with the lowest levels of youth unemployment, those countries that have either maintained or reduced uh, youth unemployment despite a global economic recession, um, are all countries with very well-established vocational training systems uh, that are highly valued with employers and where employers uh, have a very active role in. And in terms of uh, the, the, the target of 40%, uh, my understanding of the Commission's work is that they have, uh, like I, looked at the best performing European countries. And at present, uh, Scotland has the ninth lowest uh, youth unemployment rate 
in Europe. I would concede uh, youth unemployment uh, remains far, far too high, and I think that's a point we can all unite on. But what the report, I suppose the 40%, is uh, illustrative um, of what we would need to do um, if Scotland was to become amongst the top three or five best performing uh, European economies. So let me uh, reassure uh, Ms Mara that we are not uh, dampened uh, by our ambition uh, one little bit. I think we can unite in the fact that we want to eradicate youth unemployment. We might have a difference of opinion as to how best to do that. I would certainly rather see uh, this Parliament with a fuller range of job creating uh, powers. Uh, that's one aspect, but I think in terms of the here and now in the report, uh, I very much hope we can work together uh, as we develop those implementation plans. Now, Ms Mara is right. Uh, there is £12 million allocated to kickstart uh, our work to progress uh, the Wood Commission. Um, I've allocated £4.5 million of that today. Uh, and what I now uh, want to do, and it's work that I have started, is, is to work with our partners in local government and also colleges uh, and the Funding Council uh, to discuss um, about how we might utilise the, the rest of those funds. So that's very important discussions that have commenced and that will continue in the next few weeks. And of course, we'll report back to Parliament. Mary Scanlon, followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you. In the one minute I've got, can I welcome the statement? Can I welcome the proposals? And can I put on record a Conservative support for Sir Ian Wood uh, and, and his commission? Uh, and my questions are, um, can I first of all ask, uh, in terms of the careers guidance tool, which is to help parents uh, understand better the merits of vocational education, uh, it would be helpful to get an update on that. And also, how can we track the progress of the those who engage in vocational education, which was recommended uh, by the Commission, the new senior phase benchmarking tool. And uh, my third point is on, I also very much welcome additional levels four and fives, but as the Minister rightly, Cabinet Secretary, rightly states, only 10 females did level five this past year and 114 male. So it's just to ask how that will be addressed and like Jenny Mara, will the colleges get their fair share? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to Mary Scanlon for uh, her support. I know she's tracked uh, the work of the Wood Commission uh, from the, the very early days and has attended and participated uh, in a number of events uh, with stakeholders, um, and that is certainly appreciated. In terms of the, the work that I've announced today and the funding that I've announced today, um, essentially that is um, around implementing the recommendations uh, in the report with regards to earlier uh, careers uh, advice, information and guidance. We, of course, have to do that in full partnership um, with local government. Um, anything in and around schools uh, requires very close uh, partnership working. But I'm very uh, keen that from the perspective of Skills Development Scotland, um, that as we you know, engage with our partners, that uh, government agencies such as Skills Development Scotland uh, are funded and are ready to act uh, to proceed um, with the recommendations about earlier career guidance, because that's certainly something that, that, that chimes with me. We've got to get young people uh, the right information um, prior to them making subject choices. And in terms of their qualities uh, agenda, we really do need to start to be engaging uh, with young children, I think, while they're at uh, primary school. And many people would argue that the work that my colleague Aileen Campbell does in the early years, that there's work around there that we need to be doing um, even earlier to, to break down those uh, crucial barriers. So, in essence, SDS will be primed uh, to engage on earlier uh, careers uh, advice um, and that they uh, are developing uh, national resources, uh, tools um, that can be used in primary schools and crucially can be used with parents. I attended Forth Valley College yesterday and heard about the, the great work that they do, uh, not just in engaging and advising uh, young people in that area um, of the vocational opportunities, but also um, selling a message uh, to parents as well as you like. Um, and I do feel that parents are absolutely crucial in this agenda. Our young people, first and foremost, 
people who support young people, teachers and those um, in colleges, um, employers, you know, we can't do it without them, but we also need to be ensuring that the right information is getting to parents. So there will be some work done around uh, an occupational outlook and essentially that will be taking labour market information, information from skills investment plans, and I suppose translating it into simple digestible uh, language so that we can you know, get information uh, quickly and easily uh, to those who are uh, helping young people with their choices and helping young people uh, to inform uh, their, their opinion. I know time's short, uh, presiding officer. Um, we have had many debates um, about how to improve the quality and the participation um, of various young people. The, the crucial thing about our modern apprenticeship programme is it works. We know that it leads to sustainable employment, so therefore there's an increased onus on us all to ensure that more young people, irrespective of gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, disability, and those young people from care backgrounds can actually get access to this opportunity. And there's a wide range of recommendations that take a life stage approach that is thinking about what's happening in schools, what's happening in SDS, what's happening in colleges and making us all um, accountable for that and we will of course all have to report back in due course. Thank you Cabinet Secretary. If we could have a bit shorter answers that would be extremely helpful. That goes for the questions too. Ms Fabiani followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am particularly pleased to see the plans in the report for schools and colleges to, to join with employers in sustained fruitful partnerships, and that will be to mutual benefit. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, there are already employers in East Cobride interested in the, these um, ideas, and that must be the same in many other places. And I wonder if there's been any consideration given to some fast-track pilot projects uh, for companies who are already concerned about skills shortages and want to very much encourage local people uh, into employment, I think this would be an excellent way to, to spearhead this very exciting initiative and uh, would reiterate, has consideration been given to this? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, indeed, um, employers are absolutely uh, crucial to this agenda and uh, that, that Hearts and Minds campaign um, about persuading young people and their parents about the, the, how their career prospects will be enhanced by pursuing uh, vocational training is imperative. But we also know we have a Hearts and Minds campaign to engage with employers and many employers uh, realise the value of young people in their workforce uh, and the economic case for investing in young people. Given the nature of some of the employers in Ms Fabiani's constituency, she might be interested to know that some of the um, early progress we're making, in particular with um, advanced apprenticeships, uh, the pilots for advanced apprenticeships, that's career level apprenticeships, are likely to have um, an engineering uh, focus. And I think that might be of interest to some of the employers in Ms Fabiani's uh, area. There is a lot of interest um, amongst employers the length and breadth of Scotland in advanced uh, apprenticeships. And I suppose my attitude would be uh, the more interest, the better. So anything she can do, encourage it. Great. Liam MacArthur, followed by Rod Campbell. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and very much welcome the content of her statement. Can I also put on record my gratitude and that the Scottish Liberal Democrats to Sirene Wood uh, and his colleagues, uh, not just as Jenny Mara said, for his accessibility to MSPs throughout the process, but for the positive vision he's set out and the very clear and comprehensive recommendations uh, he's put forward. Uh, one of those is, is clearly around closer collaboration between colleges uh, and schools. This makes sense. Uh, it should be the objective. Uh, but it's not new. It's been tried in the past uh, and thwarted to some extent, and not least by issues around funding and problems around double funding. Is there anything the Cabinet Secretary can share with us at this stage uh, that would give us confidence that some of those problems that have uh, perhaps inhibited uh, that closer collaboration can be overcome uh, going forward? Cabinet Secretary. I think Ms MacArthur's uh, right to intimate that there are already you know, existing examples of good uh, partnership working between schools and colleges. I know in West Lothian, in my own area, that there's a shared uh, timetable for, for pupils uh, in, in the senior phase. I think what's different this time, and I take the point uh, that you know, some of this has been tried before, is that I don't think um, the uh, level or uh, level of ambition has been seen uh, before, either in terms of the, uh, the scale or indeed the, 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 the purpose. Um, he's right about the issues you know, in the past about, about double funding, but um, as we you know, move forward, um, 
you know, we're building on existing assets. And I suppose the one thing that's different now as opposed to in the past um, is um, schools in terms of curriculum for excellence. And it was um, encouraging to see um, that uh, Serene Wood uh, recognised the existing assets, uh, both in terms of our colleges, he described them as re-energised uh, following reorganisation, and um, he had a, a deep praise for Curriculum for Excellence. So I suppose there's two things now um, that will set us up uh, for good progress and good success um, with what I would describe as, as renewed uh, partnership working between schools, colleges and businesses. Because what both schools and colleges now all must do is be much more outward facing and engaging with industry. Roderick Campbell, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The recent Children and Young People Act has put in place significant steps to change the outcome of people leaving care. But as Sir Ian Wood states, care leavers experience some of the poorest educational and employment outcomes of any group of young people. Whilst I welcome the recommendations on people leaving care, however, However, can the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, can the Minister advise on any further detail on how they will be taken further? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I uh, thank Mr Campbell. Um, I'm not precious about titles. Uh, Mr Campbell doesn't have to worry um, about that. But what I can assure him of um, is my absolute commitment to care leavers and the commitment that exists in this government and across uh, this chamber to uh, improving uh, the career prospects and the life prospects um, of care leavers. Uh, as a former social worker, I know I talk about that a lot, um, but it is uh, something of my former career that has left uh, an ongoing mark. Um, there's a number of recommendations in uh, relation to care leavers. We are discussing them um, with our, our partners. I'm very open uh, to these suggestions, uh, particularly anything that recognises and tries to deal with the delayed um, progression that care leavers and the disrupted progression that they can have in their education. And I'm very open uh, to suggestions um, for care leavers and other groups about where we can increase the, the age criteria uh, for particular incentives and support. Ketia Dugdale, followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Labour have long argued that the SNP's obsession with hitting 25,000 modern apprenticeships came at the expense of the skill needs of the economy. Does the Wood Commission's renewed focus on Level 3 MAs and above tied to growth industries prove that we were right? Cabinet Secretary. No, I don't think it does, with respect to Mr Dugdale. Um, I think there's three very important things uh, that this government has always uh, tried uh, to do, and I think uh, these things will be expanded upon as we progress with the uh, implementation uh, of, the, of the Wood Report. I should say that in terms of our modern apprenticeship programme, I'm very pleased that 62% um, of our provision on the apprenticeship programme is at level three or above, and that compares very favourably to what happens um, elsewhere uh, south of the border, and it's actually you know, a very positive increase uh, on, the, on the previous year. But in terms of the three things that we're trying to do, bearing in mind that we all know that apprenticeships work, that there's a great transition uh, from young people from education into work. So yes, we want to expand the numbers. Yes, we want to increase uh, the focus on STEM and growth areas, but we also need to do so um, in a way that increases uh, the representation of groups that are currently underrepresented. So, while we could very quickly increase the numbers, uh, that may be at the expense of STEM or women, or while we could increase uh, the numbers of STEM quite quickly, we don't want to do so um, at the expense of women. So these are the three planks um, of how we'll move forward. We want to increase numbers, increase STEM and growth areas, and increase the representation of underrepresented groups. And it is a very uh, carefully uh, planned uh, progression and we need to do that uh, with care and I think as the report itself talks about talks about a carefully managed uh, expansion and you know this government is certainly accepting uh, of the recommendations that are made around the apprenticeship program in the report. Annabel Ewing followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm uh, pleased to note in particular the general reference in the, in the statement to uh, equality uh, issues, very important, but could the Cabinet Secretary outline what concrete steps the Scottish Government will take to help improve the gender balance in subjects traditionally dominated by one sex, such as uh, STEM subjects, 
and on the other hand in areas such as uh, childcare. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I think it's, um, I'm glad that um, Ms Yoon has recognised that um, it's important to get more women in the STEM subjects, but it's also important uh, to get more young men uh, pursuing careers in childcare, uh, particularly since uh, Ms Campbell has uh, plans to expand the childcare uh, workforce because that will be much needed um, as we progress with our aspirations for uh, universal childcare. I think it's really important that um, when you look at this report, for the first time, um, you know, Skills Development Scotland, uh, Scottish Funding Council will have to um, report on the progress made in response to very detailed um, action plans. Um, we're very clear that, that we need to have a life stage report um, starting in schools but have you know, a range of actions and activities uh, throughout the education system um, and throughout the, the, the pathway uh, to, to, to work. I'm very struck by the current examples of um, some pre-employability, pre-apprenticeship programmes. Uh, they seem to me uh, well-placed to uh, target specific uh, groups. Um, but there is no silver bullet uh, to all of this, and Scotland isn't alone. And when I look around uh, the best-performing European economies, uh, some of them do very good things in terms of equalities and occupational segregation um, in particular areas, but there is no obvious uh, world leader in terms of tackling occupational segregation. So I think there's a space there for uh, Scotland uh, with our collective will and collective action uh, for us to become uh, a world leader in tackling uh, things like occupational segregation. Ken okay, McIntosh, followed by Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the Minister's statement and her support for the work of the Wood Commission. The Minister will be aware that the number of uh, young people between 18 and 24 who remain or, or who become, in fact, economically inactive remains stubbornly high. And in fact, the most recent figures show another increase to 129,000 this year. So far, the government's measures seem, uh, the government's found it very difficult to halt this rise. Uh, can I ask which of today's announcements does she expect to be of greatest benefit to those in this group who, are, who have actually withdrawn from the workforce altogether? Cabinet Secretary. I think the part of my ministerial statement that I didn't actually reach um, was discussing how we progress with the uh, recommendations com contained in the Wood Report, but how as part of that we need to refresh the youth employment uh, strategy. Um, we know that the economy is now improving, but the big task for us is to ensure how our young people uh, benefit from uh, economic growth. And that, um, I suppose, in its essence, was part of our desire for commissioning uh, the work undertaken by Wood. Because when you look at Scotland in good economic times, youth unemployment and those disengaged from the labour market remained too high. I talk about it a lot, but 2006-07 youth unemployment in this country peaked at 14 per cent at a time of economic growth. So what we now need to do is have a world-class vocational training system that actually establishes better pathways to work uh, for all our young people when the economy is in good times and in bad. Jim Eady, followed by Margaret McCullough. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, what steps is the Cabinet Secretary taking to ensure that the expansion of modern apprenticeships is properly aligned, as recommended by Sir Ian Wood, with the skills required to support economic growth? And how does she see the introduction and development of an industry quality and improvement regime contributing to the development and promotion of higher level modern apprenticeships, which she mentioned, and also the development of pilots for advanced apprenticeships? I hope Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. Officer, I would um, outlined some of that in my statement. Uh, certainly, um, as a government, we are accepting of the recommendations from Wood uh, around uh, the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. I think Education Scotland have an important role here in terms of the quality assurance of the off-the-job um, aspect of apprenticeships, and they're certainly involving more um, industry uh, specialists. Um, but having that range of good quality apprenticeships from, you know, from one end, having access to apprenticeships, mm -hmm. enabling people who wouldn't otherwise get access to um, getting that pathway to an apprenticeship is important. 
important, having the foundation of apprenticeships in schools is very important in terms of incentivising businesses uh, to take on apprentices because um, there's much of the work can be done in schools in our education system, um, preparing people for the employed status uh, apprenticeship. And in terms of the advanced apprenticeships, I think there's a really important message there that vocational education um, is challenging. Um, and it's not just for young people who don't do as well as they'd hoped uh, in their hires, uh, that vocational training and education is actually for, for young people of all abilities. It's for young people of a range of abilities. Margaret McCullough, followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. The Commission comment on the need for additional funding if there's to be a longer term growth in the modern apprenticeship programme. But right now there are sectors facing a reduction in funding after a 10-year freeze in contribution rates. Does the, con does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that the report doesn't deal enough with contribution rates as they are now and that contribution rates should have to rise to sustain the quality of apprenticeships in future? And can I also ask the Cabinet Secretary if she would include training providers in any discussions as they are one of the major players in the delivery of the ME programme? Yes, uh, absolutely. I agree that training providers uh, are uh, major stakeholders. Um, I'm certainly to, uh, more than happy to have discussions and do have discussions with training providers. Um, but if Ms McCulloch um, wants to have a, a particular discussion with me in, and involving training providers in that uh, regard in the Wood report, there is uh, absolutely uh, no problem about that. Um, as she'll know that the contribution rates um, are an operational matter for Skills Development Scotland, um, they do uh, have to align with things like the cost of assessment and the, the cost of training um, and you know, reflect um, you know, the, the, the government's economic uh, strategy as well. But um, given um, you know, the, the publication of Wood, um, you know, Skills Development Scotland will you know, have to have another look um, at everything in the round. Lord MacDonald. Presiding officer, uh, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what recommendations the Commission has made in order to encourage an increase in the current 29% of employers who recruit young people directly from education? Cabinet Secretary. I think there are uh, many recommendations in the report that are uh, focused on making a, a contribution towards increasing the, the overall uh, proportion of the young workforce. Um, in Scotland just now, 29% uh, um, of employers uh, recruit directly from education. Um, I most certainly want to see that figure um, increase. And not the only part of that, but I think a crucial part to that is the um, invest in young people groups who essentially um, will be, you know, act as local campaigners and champions. Uh, these groups have to be employer-led, they have to be um, industry-led, and that's why um, today, you know, I announced the, the million pounds to support uh, these local employer uh, partnerships, um, to, you know, to help that work um, get off the ground. Um, I'm absolutely committed to uh, making life easier for employers uh, so that they can offer good quality opportunities opportunities to, to young people. Thank you. I'm going to call Alison Johnston, um, but before I do so, can I just say that I had noted that the member came in almost halfway through the statement. I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think it's acceptable for any member. Um, and can I remind members, you should be in here from the beginning of the statements, um, because I promise you, um, when we come back from the recess, we're going to enforce it rigidly. Alison Johnston. Um, thank you. I apologise unreservedly for missing the beginning of the Cabinet Secretary's statement. I welcome recognition of the importance of vocational training and the increased investment in it. Here in Scotland, as globally, rates of business ownership amongst women remain stubbornly low. Will this greater focus on vocational training, equality and improved careers guidance see more young women consider an entrepreneurial future? Cabinet Secretary. I most certainly uh, hope so, uh, President Officer, um, and I think you know, that there would be you know, strong evidence uh, for that with things such as earlier um, careers information, uh, advice and guidance that's uh, bringing to life uh, earlier the world of work. I think the role of employers, um, including female employers, will do much to promote uh, entrepreneurial uh, 
activism uh, and aspiration uh, amongst our, our young people. So I think it would be credible, um, you know, for while this uh, report isn't about women in business as such, but I do think there will be some um, direct and indirect spin-offs. And uh, I certainly hope, presiding officer, when we come back from recess, that I will have learnt to have been much more briefer. <laughs> One can live in hope, Cabinet Secretary, yes. one can live in hope. That ends the statement from Angela Constant on developing Scotland's young for workforce. The next site of business is a debate on motion number 1047 in the name of Keith Brown on support for armed forces and veteran communities in Scotland. I'll just give a few seconds for the front benches to get themselves settled and organised. Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary, uh, Minister, you've got 13 minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. The 70th anniversary commemorations of the D-Day landings on the 6th of June 1944 in Normandy, France, took place recently with widespread recognition across generations, young and old. And I think we have to ask the question is, why did the marking of an event so long ago have such a draw, such an impact and generate so much interest? And why is it in our national psyche? Well, the 6th of June 1944 changed the world. It led ultimately to the end of the Second World War and a much more peaceful Europe. I'm very much looking forward next week to going to Conto Maison, where McRae's battalion, including players and supporters of Hearts Football Club and other football clubs in Scotland, uh, many of whom perished on the 1st of July uh, in the push on the Somme. But we have seen an increase in peace since that Second World War. Uh, the sacrifice, though, made that day in Normandy by so many, uh, by the dead and those who survived, has always been recognised and acknowledged. It was and is those who defended our freedoms, past, present and indeed future, who deserve our respect, our gratitude and our appreciation. Of course, commemorations were not confined to Normandy. I was honoured to join the Under Secretary of State for Scotland, the head of the army in Scotland, politicians from across the political spectrum, and veterans and their families at a reception in the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle. And that was a genuinely, genuinely enjoyable and uplifting occasion, and I met uh, many remarkable people at that event. Uh, the Scottish Government is also playing its part in commemorating uh, World War I, which I've just mentioned. And a number of events in Scotland were recently announced by the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs. Uh, as members will know, and I'm sure welcome, Stirling will host Armed Forces Day this Saturday. And this is the second time in five years that Scotland has played host. And I believe that's deserved recognition of the esteem in which Scotland holds our Armed Forces community. In terms of Scottish Government support, I can confirm that a grant of £80,000 has been made to the Council in respect of Armed Forces Day. Secondly, the First Minister will join principal guests on the day. Uh, I too will be there and look forward to uh, showing my support for our service personnel. It is, after all, one of my local Armed Forces Day events. And I would strongly encourage members to join their local events or to come along to Stirling, and I'm sure they'd be impressed if they do. In the weeks to come, the support of the Army, Royal Navy and Royal Air Force personnel in making the Commonwealth Games the success they will undoubtedly be will also be a testament to their professionalism and skills. Uh, with this recognition, though, we should not forget about the Cadet Forces, Army, Sea, Marine, Air Training, Course, uh, Air Training Corps and Combined Cadets. They are to be found all over Scotland and are a shining example of young people at their best. Indeed, I met two RAF cadets uh, today and uh, displaying many of those characteristics. And interestingly, the UK government has recently announced uh, funding from the Department of Education uh, for the expansion of cadet forces. And that's something that um, I would certainly wish to investigate further and support. I've uh, met, as I've said, with two uh, cadets today. I made clear to them as well, because uh, this is one of the questions that cadets have asked, that certainly, in, in my view, in an independent Scotland, the important role played by cadet forces would be maintained uh, and we'd expect it to flourish. And that's because we value what the cadets do and what people get from the cadet forces. Uh, members will recall that back in January, uh, I announced we'd create a new Scottish Veterans Commissioner. And there was broad support and consensus around the establishment of that post. I should recognise, I think, the opposition to some extent of the Liberal Democrats and the reservations, some of which were expressed by uh, Alec Ferguson at that point. But they were generally supportive, I think, of the idea uh, of the Commissioner's role. 
And I very much welcome that non-partisan approach in discussing ways in which to support our 400,000 plus veterans. And a very thorough and detailed process has been followed to get the uh, right appointment. The advertising process elicited considerable interest and a strong field of candidates. And I believe that the Commissioner will be in a pivotal position to improve the ways in which veterans access public, private and voluntary services. Uh, and what ties all of the Commissioner's work together, of course, is how effective it proves to be. And that's why I'll be asking for regular reports from the Commissioner. We're very nearly at the end of that process and expect to make an announcement uh, shortly. Uh, the reports which I've mentioned, though, should lead to action, and the crucial point is that they should also lead to better services and support for our veterans. Uh, often in our roles, we learn of the problems faced by those coming out of the military or those who returned to civilian life some time ago. Uh, before any examination of perceived problems, I'd like to make clear that there are more than, as I've said, 400,000 veterans in Scotland, and the overwhelming majority of these, including the 2,000 or so who, who return to live in Scotland each year, do so without any real difficulty. Uh, they return to civilian life with skills, experience and a sense of civic responsibility that is entirely admirable. Uh, they are assets to their local communities, and we are the richer for having them as neighbours. I discussed the need to convey positive messages about veterans to Lord Ashcroft, and he agreed. In fact, it's the centrepiece and the main theme of Lord Ashcroft's Veterans Transition Review, published back in February. I think it is important to nail some myths and portray an accurate uh, picture in relation to veterans. Uh, the Scottish prison population, for example, is not and has never been dominated by veterans. In the latest Scottish Prison Service Bulletin, only 200, just under 3% of the prison population self-identified as veterans. And that comes against an average total of over 8,000 prisoners held in custody in Scotland. Even if other recent surveys are taken into account, that number rises, if it rises at all, only to 600 at most. And that position is consistent with various studies in respect of the prison population in England and Wales. And crucially, these numbers are far fewer than some occasionally lurid headlines would have us believe. It's also true to... Certainly. Alex Ferguson. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Minister for that for taking the intervention. I, I absolutely agree with him. We can, we can over-egg this particular issue. But would he acknowledge the fact that, I think I'm right in saying that uh, the number of prisoners, the number of veterans in prison last year in Scotland rose by 40 per cent is uh, a figure that we need not to be complacent about. Uh, Minister Keith Brown. Uh, I take the point uh, raised by Alec Ferguson. I would refer back to the, the uh, figures I've just mentioned and also to the fact that Veterans First Point are doing some important work in this just now, which could, should give us some more detail, which I think would be welcome uh, all round. I was going to say that not all veterans are homeless and not all people, homeless people are veterans. Most veterans live in their own homes with parents, spouses and partners and with children. Uh, and I welcome approaches by councils, for example, like Dumfries and Galloway, who award veterans extra points on the allocation scale, something that was made possible through legislation that we brought forward. Uh, and making use of its capacity building grant of £200,000 over three years in the Scottish Government, Veterans Scotland is undertaking a mapping study of approaches to housing allocations and is investigating ways in which its own common housing register for ex-service charities might be adopted more widely. And I will look to Veterans Scotland and to the Commissioner to work together and come up with innovative ideas, proposals and, of course, possible solutions. And addressing the needs of veterans experiencing mental health problems is also a priority. There is a wide variation in the reported prevalence of PTSD by the media and others often without evidence. But a study by the King's Centre for Military Health Research in London in 2010 on the consequences of deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan on the mental health of the armed forces reported prevalence of PTSD at around 4%. However, I do not, uh, of course, underestimate the impact of PTSD, and nor do I trivialise the uh, difficulties faced by those living with it. PTSD, of course, uh, really presents an isolation, and veterans will experience uh, mental health problems similar to the general population, most commonly depression, stress and anxiety. And responding to those needs is just as important, and we are taking action through delivery of a range of commitments in a national mental health strategy. We also continue to fund the Commission Service in partnership with NHS Scotland in Combat Stress for the provision of specialist mental health services, including an intensive PTSD programme at £1.2 million per annum. We also continue to fund the Combat Stress Community Outreach Services across Scotland at £200,000 per annum, and we're providing Veterans First Point with £200,000 this year for its one-stop shop offering help and assistance to veterans and their families. The ranks of the unemployed, uh, too high by any measure, are also not filled with veterans disproportionately. Service personnel do leave the military, and many 
the vast majority go on to other successful careers. However, our ex-service men and women can also face a number of barriers that affect their successful transition back to civilian life. And of course, as with everyone else, unemployment can have a detrimental effect on a number of aspects of the lives of veterans. Disability, lack of transferable skills, poverty and housing prob problems can all be linked to difficulties in accessing employment, which is why this is an area we need to address and support. And just to mention as well, sometimes the lack of awareness that some veterans have about the skills which they do have, which are transferable, is also an issue which we have to try and uh, address. It is widely agreed that early intervention with veterans is key to a successful transition, with potential barriers identified and targeted. And Remploy have concerns that veterans are not utilising or recognising areas where they need help and specialist support. Therefore, we are looking at how to address this problem and target those who are most in need and help them back into work. And employment support is available for the most vulnerable ex-service men and women through the new service, Employable, created by Poppy Scotland and the mental health charity Sam H. All 32 local authorities are working together to develop local support services that link into the armed forces covenant while working with key service providers. And successful transition and integration into employment relies upon easy access to services and relevant help being available. But elsewhere, the Scottish Government has also been making progress in health. We have implemented the recommendations of the Morrison Report, Better Deal for Amputees, providing £2 million for a new national specialist prosthetic service. In housing, we have facilitated through grants uh, large housing construction projects for veterans at Cranhill in Glasgow and in Carnoustie. Uh, on community justice, we have worked with Police Scotland on the appointment of an armed forces and veterans champion who has hit the ground running. Uh, everyone now who enters a police station will be asked if they are a serving uh, armed, force, uh, armed forces member or a veteran, and those figures will be shared with the Scottish Government. Veterans organisations, if I could just mention those, presiding officer coming to a conclusion, many of whom are represented in the gallery here today, are an absolutely invaluable asset in the work that the Scottish Government undertakes. They are at the co-face of support uh, to veterans. Uh, they provide a wide variety of services and support that I witness across the country, and it never fails to amaze me, uh, as does their inventiveness and their tenacity. And that's why the Scottish Government supports veterans' organisations. We have, of course, the Scottish Veterans Fund, which has distributed so far around £600,000 to more than 70 projects to date, and have increased the annual amount available by 50% to £120,000. It's for the same reason that I provided Veterans Scotland with capacity building funding of £200,000 over three years. And I look forward to continued joint working with Martin Gibson and his team, who are now better resourced than ever to take forward the work that matches their ambitions. Our approach to improving outcomes for veterans must be based, above all, in working in partnership with these organisations. I know one of the concerns previously expressed in relation to the uh, Commissioner's appointment was to make sure that that appointment, that position, in no way uh, supplanted or undermined the work uh, undertaken by our veterans' organisations, and that is absolutely the case. And, uh, uh, of course, the veterans' organisations are aware of that fact, as will be the new Commissioner. But uh, this is the approach, partnership, working with veterans' organisations that I look to the veterans' commissioner to take forward as he or she goes about their work. And it's also the approach that we as a government seek to pursue. Uh, our armed forces personnel and veterans have earned our respect, our support, and most definitely their place in our communities. Uh, and finally, uh, presiding officer, what I would say is, and I've said this before, and I, I hope it does become a cliche, actually, because it's certainly very true, that when somebody joins the armed forces, they make an extraordinary commitment. They commit themselves to undertaking things which other people taking forward that kind of commitment would not be asked to do. And I think given that extraordinary nature of that commitment, it's in, they're entitled to expect an extraordinary commitment back from us uh, through the state and its various uh, bodies. Uh, they put themselves in, in dangerous way, and I think we have to recognise that. They're not looking for advantage, uh, but they're looking to have any disadvantages that they may have through the service that they've undertaken removed, and certainly we'd wish to do that. And on that note, uh, President Officer, I'd uh, be happy to move the motion in my name. Any thanks? And I now call on Mark Griffin. Uh, up to nine minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. I, I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate on the subject of Armed Forces veterans and the, the vital support services and charities that operate in communities in Scotland and throughout the UK. From the outset, I would like to acknowledge, as in the, the government motion, the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in defence of freedom and to put on record the continued support that we, on this side of the chamber, 
um, give to our armed forces personnel and the over 400,000 veterans in Scotland and also echo and support the comments made um, by the, the Minister about the, the real support on the ground that, that there was for um, the, the veterans returning to, to celebrate 70 years on from, from, from D-Day. We are committed to continuing to work on that cross-party basis to ensure that our veterans and families receive the, the support that they need and deserve. And particularly, in particular, we recognise that our service personnel often need help with transition um, to civilian life, particularly in finding housing and employment, and a, a recognition that those who leave the service can bear physical and psychological scars for many years after their, their service ends. Being a, a member of the armed forces, particularly during times of conflict, is immensely stressful, stressful beyond anything I think that we can imagine. Um, what that stressful situation creates, though, is a level of, of commitment and an, an intense bond among service personnel that is unique to our armed forces in this country. I could only listen and try and take on board what, when hearing from a soldier who had served um, in conflict what it was like to come under fire and the impact that has on, on um, their battalion, their regiments, when they lose a, a member of the, their own who is as close to them as a member of their own family. I can only imagine how isolated then someone must feel if they're discharged from the armed forces into society alone, perhaps, with no family support after having such a, a close bond to the comrades they fought with and possibly lost in combat. Now, going from living in such close quarters with people you considered family, eating, sleeping, working, socialising with that same close group to then be discharged into a community of strangers who tend not to understand military life and the, the bond between people it creates. Now, as the Minister said, the majority of servicemen and women make a successful transition to civilian life, and really the, the veterans we have in Scotland aren't a problem, they're an asset, they're an asset um, to communities, and I think the Minister's quite right as well to flag up that a lot of vet veterans have um, transferable skills that they perhaps don't realise that they have that then become assets to to companies and, and communities. But uh, for those reasons that I mentioned earlier, it really isn't hard to see why some, some veterans do struggle to, to reintegrate, and that can put a massive strain on family life um, for, those to, for those struggling to adapt and for those um, without um, family. It's of vital importance, then, that the advice and support services are in place for former service personnel to adjust to living in mainstream society and that we support those plans to coordinate and deliver support and advice services from the public, private and voluntary sectors for ex-service personnel and their, their partners and, the, and their children. There are too many fantastic organisations providing support and advice to ex-service personnel and their families to mention and do justice to all the work that they do, but I'd like to, to mention um, some, the first of which I, I've spoken about before, and they give the experience of what being an armed, force, armed forces reservist actually involved. Sabre um, give advice and, and information on the extra skills a reservist can bring to, to an organisation or a company to try and um, boost the likelihood of companies employing um, reservists. They provide weekend training courses for employers um, so that they can see exactly what kind of skills um, a reservist picks up in their training and then what they can bring back into their um, organisations. And that there's a, an open invitation from Sabre, certainly, to, to any MSPs who would like to go on any of those training weekends, I'd be happy to pass on any details. Um, we, we have to continue to support um, the organisations which do the, the tremendous work in the community for service 
uh, former service personnel across Scotland, including the, the Royal British Legion. The Legion provides practical care, advice and support to armed forces personnel, ex-service men and women of all ages and their families. It runs the, the Poppy Appeal annually and recent appeals have emphasised the, the increasing need to help the men and women who are serving today um, as well as ex-service people and their dependents. Um, the Legion also assists any service man or woman to pursue their entitlement to award disablement pension and every year up to 200 ex-service personnel in Scotland are represented at war pensions tribunals. Um, we have the, the Scottish veterans residents just across the road from the Parliament who provide residential accommodation to over 300 ex-service personnel and their partners and have helped over 60,000 veterans throughout Scot Scotland since they were established. But the Soldiers, Sail Sailors, Airmen and Families Association, whose Lanarkshire branch covers my region in central Scotland, they offer financial, practical and much needed emotional support to current and previous members of the Armed Forces and their families through service, uh, services like Forces Line, um, a, a support service um, independent from the, the, the chain of command so that uh, serving members of the armed forces can go to them in confidence um, that they will receive the support and, ad and advice they need. And they also run a forces additional needs disability support group um, and organise children's holidays run by volunteers which um, offer experiences and activities which some of those um, children would not normally have, have access to. There's Erskine and the leading provider of care for veterans in the country. I'm happy to be wearing my Erskine tie for the debate today, which helpfully came through to the office about a, a week ago, um, providing fantastic services within the, the community. There, there are things that we can also do um, as individual MSPs to assist armed forces personnel, veterans and their family take up that offer to go on one of the training weekends with SABA um, on Friday with the support of the British Legion and other charities, the Citizens Advice Bureau, Combat Stress, Erskine, and North Lanarkshire Council and, and the Lanarkshire Armed Forces Association, Association I'll be holding a, a veteran surgery in Cumbernauld to, to mark Armed Forces Day and bring those groups together to give advice and support to, to any veterans in the, in the Lanarkshire area, certainly. Minister Keith Brown in his last minute. Sports, uh, that you mentioned there, and also the early reference to the weekends, the training weekends. I'm meeting with Anna Subri, the UK Defence Minister, uh, next week and be asking her if she will allow the Armed Forces programme, which Westminster runs for its members, to be extended to the devolved administrations to give members more experience with the Armed Forces. And I wonder if that's something he would support. Mr Griffin, in your final 30 seconds, please. Yep, certainly, certainly would, would be happy to come together with the Minister and see if we can um, add cross-party to support to that, to that scheme. Um, being extended, I'll touch briefly. And I know that the, the, the interviews for the new Veterans Commissioner have been held recently, and I hope whoever is appointed there will be able to, to build on the good work that I think has already been um, taking place by the government in our, in our veteran community. And, President Officer, I'll, I'll close as I, as I open by acknowledging that debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in, in defence of freedom in our armed forces, and that we'll be supporting the, the government motion at decision time and as always uh, happy to work on a cross-party basis to support veterans in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Ferguson. Six minutes please. Uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. Yesterday like uh, many other colleagues I'm sure in the chamber I attended the flag raising ceremony in my nearest town which marked the start of Armed Forces Week. There wasn't a huge turnout but it was impossible not to be moved by the pride and the passion and the camaraderie that was so clearly evident in the small group of elderly veterans in attendance as they drew themselves smartly to attention as the flag was raised. And that passion, pride and camaraderie is surely totally justified because it is almost entirely thanks to their selflessness, courage and commitment that we all now enjoy a comparatively safe existence in today's world, as the Minister acknowledged in his opening speech. So it's absolutely right that the motion before us begins by acknowledging the debt of gratitude that we owe to our armed forces, past and present. 
that the minister himself is numbered among them, I think simply adds to the quality of the depth of understanding and interest that this parliament has shown in armed forces and veterans related issues since its earliest days. As I said in the debate we had on the 14th of January, that interest has been continued in a largely exemplary fashion by this government and in a way that's been welcomed by the armed forces and veterans community. And I would hope that that level of support and interest will be continued by this parliament and its governors, gov governments of whatever political colour they may be in the future for many years to come. Yes, briefly, sir. David Stewart. Further to the contribution that the Minister made in, Mark, in the intervention of Mark Griffin, we do share my interest in having a scheme in the Scottish Parliament for the Armed Forces, uh, since I participated in the Commons and was excellent. Uh, we do share my support that we should be looking at this on a cross-party basis. Uh, I would hope that this, these issues of all are ones that we could share on a cross-party basis, and I would absolutely endorse that feeling. Um, those that put their lives on the line for our security in the past and currently deserve no less than our full support. And I'm quite sure we'd all agree on that. And I think everything that the minister said in his opening comments suggested that certainly for the time being, that will be the case. Now, I do acknowledge the fact that the vast majority of ex-servicemen make a seamless transition back into civilian life. But there are many who will need and will continue to need our support and interest, presiding officer. One of the remarkable outcomes of recent conflicts has been the incredible response of the public. Now, I've no doubt that that response has been prompted and in some ways even promoted by the fact that the media can now virtually bring the stark reality of modern-day warfare into our own homes in a graphic and previously unthinkable way. Indeed, the sight of returning forces and, worse, the funeral cortages of those who pay the ultimate price has undoubtedly awoken the conscience of the public in a remarkable fashion. Literally hundreds of charities have been established in recent years, all for the very best of reasons, but many of which one has to say overlap to a degree in what they seek to achieve. And the result of that is that there is a growing element of duplication of effort that inevitably leads to a degree of competition between some charities in attracting the willingness of the public to donate to veterans related causes. And that willingness to donate actually highlights a further potential concern because there's little doubt that as our involvement in overseas theatres of war reduces and the accompanying media exposure declines, the attention and interest of the general public will inevitably decline along with it. And that does give us a problem, potentially, because as I've learnt all too clearly through the work of the cross-party group that I convene, many of the problems and issues that our veterans suffer from often don't manifest themselves until several years after their discharge. So we could face a declining level of public empathy and financial contribution alongside a growing requirement for help and support as many of the issues that will come to light for today's serving personnel become evident over the next 10 to 20 years. And many of the larger charities already recognise this and I was very pleased to host a seminar in the Parliament just a few weeks ago at which the Royal British Legion Scotland, now known I think as Legion Scotland, brought together several of the main players in both the voluntary and the charitable sector to discuss its plans to restructure and to work with others in partnership to provide support for the future. Others are doubtless doing the same. And this brings me to the role of the Commissioner Presiding Officer. As the Minister mentioned, I did have a few personal reservations about the role of the Commissioner, but I am happy to admit that many of them have now dissipated somewhat as I have thought about the role more carefully. And I hope that he or she will be able to ensure or take steps to ensure that the huge number of armed forces and veterans related charities do not duplicate their efforts. Because if the generosity of the public is to be used to the maximum effect, it is essential that duplication of effort is um, addressed. And my colleague Alec Johnson will speak later of the need for government, local authorities, health boards and others to all work together to ensure maximum effectiveness. But I would suggest that the Commissioner might well have a role to play in that process. All of our local authorities and our health boards now have dedicated armed forces champions, but there is a clear need for a more joined up approach across the public sector, just as there is in the third sector, if we're to maximise the support available to our armed forces veterans. Some of it is actually pretty basic, um, there are many local council switchboards that don't even know who the veterans champion is. So if you ring up to get him, you can't. That's, a, that's not rocket science. 
Presiding officer, in closing, I would just say that I think the armed forces themselves still have a lot to do in preparing their serving personnel for discharge and for ensuring that they are fully prepared for the intense dose of realism that often accompanies the return to Civvy Street. An awful lot has been done in latter years within the armed forces to improve this facet of service, but there's a lot more that could and should be done. And if everyone, just closing, presiding officer, if everyone, the MOD governments at both UK and Scottish levels, our local council health boards and the voluntary sector all meet the coming challenges successfully, then we can be as proud of the lifelong support we offer as we are of those armed forces personnel and veterans to whom we offer it. That must surely be our goal. I'm pleased to support the motion. Many thanks. And we now move to open the debate. Very tight for time today, up to six minutes speeches. Please call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Of course, it's a very poignant time to be having this debate in the run-up to Armed Forces Day and commemorations taking place in communities across the country, marking anniversaries specific to our Army, Navy and RAF and the exceptional sacrifices made in World Wars I and II. So, of course, we should support our service men and women, past and present, full-time and reservist, and so I am pleased to support the Minister's motion, particularly noting progress with the appointment of a new Scottish Veterans Commissioner to ensure the highest level of services and support available for our armed forces community. I understand that this ambassador will work with service charities, um, local authorities and health boards to identify any areas in public services that could provide greater support to veterans and help shape future policy developments and opportunities. Of course, there has been some progress already made across public services. In health, uh, amongst other things, there has been a raft of measures put in place by the Scottish Government to remove any disadvantage that is faced by the armed forces community in accessing uh, the NHS. Priority NHS treatment for veterans both serving and retired reservists with a service-related condition. And uh, what was very important, uh, ensuring that veterans can receive state-of-the-art prosthetic limbs, which are of an equivalent standard to those given by the Defence Medical Services. Specialist mental health services were noted by uh, the Minister as well. And in partnership with NHS Scotland and Combat Stress, these services have been enhanced by the introduction of a six-week intensive post-traumatic stress disorder treatment programme. That's extremely important because uh, PTSD uh, can be something that happens um, immediately to someone post-trauma, or it's something that can manifest itself a long way down the line. It's really important that these things are recognised. And having an armed forces champion in every NHS board in Scotland is extremely important. Of course, uh, we do have the same in local authorities, and I, I do recognise what Alec Ferguson says about it not always being apparent uh, that there are these specialist people there to try and help coordinate. So I hope that when we do, in fact, appoint the veterans champion, um, the veterans commissioner, that that's the kind of thing that will be pulled together and give much greater recognition uh, to what's going on out there. In housing, um, there has been guidance for landlords, uh, has been revised and highlights issues for ex-service personnel and gives landlords flexibilities. <laughs> Again, um, I remember um, having a fairly long meeting uh, with an organisation who dealt with such things some time ago now, who did have concerns that um, some of the allocation policies were patchy across the west of Scotland, certainly. So, again, I would hope that when we do have um, the, the veterans... I keep forgetting the actual name. Veterans ambassador, veterans champion, veterans commissioner. Ah, he's the one, she's the one, uh, in place, that that kind of thing can be very much pulled together. As with education, um, we have recognised additional challenges that face children of service families, for example, due to the nature uh, of their parents' postings. And I'm very, very pleased that last year there was £180,000 given for outreach projects offered through Army Cadets Associations. Transport. Um, the, the Scottish Government extended the concessionary travel scheme to include HM Forces veterans with mobility problems. And again, I'm really pleased that in the justice portfolio, because I do remember... Angela Constance, actually, um, prior to her being a Minister or Cabinet Secretary, 
and relative to her work as a prison social worker before she was elected, talked very, very much about some of the issues uh, in prisons with ex-service personnel who very often uh, were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and mental health issues and weren't getting attention. So having a veteran in custody support officer operating in each prison in Scotland um, is an excellent initiative and, of course, supplemented by the Scottish Veterans Prison in Reach group. But it's not all one way, of course. I was particularly struck by the line in, in uh, the government motion about um, the experience and sense of civic responsibility that ex-service personnel bring to society on returning to civilian life. And this is so very true. Um, the excellent work of the organisations which support our armed forces personnel are generally spearheaded by ex-service people. The Army, RAF and Sea Cadets in many of our constituencies and in my own constituency of East Cobride, we have very strong cadet organisations and they offer excellent opportunities for young people. Again, generally headed by those with military connections, as are many other voluntary organisations. Globally as well, uh, global charities are often manned by those who use their skills, learned in service and international experience to help others across the world. One that particularly um, I have unlimited respect for is Mission Aviation Fellow Fellowship, an organisation founded by a former military pilot with many ex-service personnel who work on the ground and fly to all the difficult parts of the world and help other organisations take some support and succour to those most in need. So yes, I, I do recognise the valuable skills of our service personnel. I do acknowledge the debt of gratitude that we should all have towards them. And of course, I support the motion. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And if I was a little slower than usual in rising to speak this afternoon, that is because I had the pleasure, if I may call it that, of leading out the Scottish Parliament's football team against the RAF on Friday in a game to mark Armed Forces Day. And uh, if you're interested, following last year's parliamentary triumph, the Royal Air Force this year reasserted their hold in the trophy. And I hope both the Minister and my front bench colleague, uh, uh, Mark Griffin, feel suitably gu guilty at the gaps in our defence which their absence highlighted. Uh, but as well as allowing us as parliamentarians to show our support for the armed forces, this annual fixture has highlighted the support and indeed the affection that exists amongst the wider community and amongst the footballing community in particular for our armed forces. Football clubs who have supported this fixture in the past include Kilmarnock, Hearts and Alloa. Uh, the latter club, of course, as the Minister will know, uh, pursue a policy of granting serving military personnel free entry to home matches. This year, we were very grateful to Wraith Rovers for hosting us at Starks Park in Kirkcaldy. Now, as some colleagues uh, may know, Wraith Rovers have marked 2014, the centenary of the Great War, by launching a new away strip. It is emblazoned simply with the word remember, and rather than the traditional team colours, is designed in the green and black of the hunting Stuart tartan worn by Sir George McRae's battalion. Hearts fans will be well aware of the service and sacrifice of their players in signing up for this original sportsman's battalion in late 1914. Hibbs, Falkirk and Dunfermline joined them, as did seven players from Wraith Rovers, three of whom were subsequently killed in Passchendaele and elsewhere on the Western Front. Ten other players from Wraith Rovers also enlisted between 14 and 18. When you think of those numbers, presiding officer, Whole teams of our fittest, strongest and most talented young men signing up in defence of our country, I think it's very difficult to do justice to the courage, the sense of duty and the sense of service these men displayed. But what I'm also struck by is the desire from those of us who still to this day enjoy the freedoms those soldiers fought and died for. The desire for communities today to do what we can to both recognise the sacrifice made by those in the past, but also to support our currently serving armed services personnel. This weekend, all three services, accompanied by the cadets and by veterans organisations, including the British Legion, paraded in Rook and Glen Park in East Renfrewshire, and local families turned out in their hundreds to watch the flag raising ceremony and the march past. I think every member who has spoken so far in today's debate has talked in similar terms of similar events in their own communities, revealing, I believe, the strength and the depth of this support. So, as, as well as the act of remembering what can we do to support, 
Well, to give just one example, I'm hosting a reception tomorrow evening in committee uh, room one. Um, I was going to say after decision time, but I think decision time is postponed, but during decision time, for a new scheme which has been set up to support and provide legal support to uh, serving and retired soldiers. This was the brainchild of Wing Commander Alan Steele, a local uh, constituent, and with the strenuous efforts of his wife, Lindsay, he set up a scheme, co uh, a scheme called AFLA, Armed Fo Forces Legal Action. It has brought together a network of solicitors to provide discounts and advice for soldiers both serving and retired and has as its motto for services rendered. A fitting summary for this debate, I think. This is just one simple, straightforward, but I hope very practical example of what we can do today. Retired soldiers do sometimes need considerable support to function in civilian life and support which is not always as available as it should be, whether it is in mental health, uh, or help in finding employment, I believe there's more that both the UK and Scottish governments can do. Poppy Scotland, for example, recently found out that of the 189,000 working age veterans in Scotland, some 28,000 are out of work. That's twice the unemployment rate of the general population. Now, as members have, also, have already alluded, it is often extremely difficult to account for the important and useful skills and experience soldiers accumulate while serving which makes finding civilian employment that much more difficult. When he was Shadow Defence Secretary, my own colleague Jim Murphy launched a very beneficial scheme encouraging businesses to sign up to a veterans interview programme. This scheme recognised that the skills gained in the armed forces are transferable, but can often only come across in an interview rather than on a standard application form. Many businesses signed up for this, including uh, John Lewis, uh, O2, Celtic, Greggs, Centrica, and they offered the first steps on the ladder for many ex-soldiers. Schemes like these are inexpensive to run, and yet they can make a big difference. And I would like to see, in fact, I'd like to invite the Scottish Government to see if we could do more in this area. Sam H and Poppy Scotland highlighted a similar situation in their recent launch of Employable, which provides local support, training and practical advice to assist veterans in their search for work. It involves one-to-one -one and group sessions covering things like interview techniques and targeted support where necessary. Presenting officer, there is a wider issue about the health and well-being of former soldiers, uh, which again we have talked about. The minister talked about uh, the prime minister's special representative on veterans affairs, Lord, Lord Ashcroft. And I found what I found most interesting from Lord Ashcroft's uh, recent research was that nine out of ten uh, of every people, thought, every person, think it's common for former soldiers to have severe mental health problems, and thought it was a common occurrence for former soldiers to commit suicide. Now, clearly, this is a misconception which has a negative impact on the likelihood of former serving personnel being hired into jobs or functioning normally in society. Stereotypes need to be challenged. Soldiers, the, the idea that soldiers have no skills or that they're mentally unwell or they're unfit for certain types of jobs, by challenging those stereotypes, we can provide the you correct support close, please. that uh, these men need. I believe our communities expect us to it across Parliament. Clearly, parliament, parliamentarians want us to it, and I think our armed forces need us to. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Up to six minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I join others in the Chamber this afternoon to pay tribute to those who have served their country, have made many of them, made the ultimate sacrifice for bringing peace here to the United Kingdom. And the fact that the peace here has been so enduring for so long, I think is the ultimate tribute to their sacrifice. The fact that we have perhaps taken for granted the peace that we enjoy in the United Kingdom here on these shores is a recognition of their professionalism in the Second World War and previous wars uh, before that. As the armed forces has reduced in size um, over the years, I think our personal individual contact and our awareness, our understanding of the armed forces has reduced over time. Often you wouldn't just read about deaths in the papers or hear about it on the news, it would perhaps be your own family member who had actually passed away serving their country. But now it is a little bit more remote. And also with the conflict in Northern Ireland, there was a reluctance by serving soldiers, airmen and sailors to wear their uniforms. And I think that also made the armed forces a little bit more remote from our daily lives. I think that is why we created Armed Forces Day to bring it back into our lives, to make it part and parcel of what we do, so that we can show our appreciation for the armed forces and what they do for us, but also so that they can see
how much we value them. So I think there's a great value in having Armed Forces Day, and that's why I'll be at Stirling as well on Saturday um, to recognise the contribution they make. I'll let the Minister give it. Minister Keith Brown. Benjamin, just to say on that point about making people more aware of the armed forces uh, generally, would he agree with the points made by Mark Griffin, Dave Stewart and Alec Ferguson that the armed forces parliamentary scheme, which he'll be aware of from his time in Westminster, could usefully be extended to this parliament and other devolved administrations so we can get that familiarity on an individual level with the work of the armed forces? Well, yes, of course, he can count on my support uh, for that as well. I never actually joined the um, parliamentary scheme. I was... Uh, distracted on other matters. I, did, I was part of the defence team on the defence committee, but I never uh, took part in the scheme. So perhaps I'll get a second chance uh, to take part in it this time, if they'll have me, I think is that's the big, probably more important question. Um, we were a bit um, reluctant about and reluctant to give our um, support to the appointment of the commissioner, mainly because we were concerned that this perhaps was just another appointment in the absence of real change. And what we're really looking for, I think, from this parliament is real significant change. And when we're looking for change, what we're looking at is a number of different areas. First of all, on veterans that many members have referred to this afternoon, but also in terms of personnel, serving personnel, both full time and in the increasing number of reservists that we will see in the coming years. All of that poses significant challenges that the Scottish Government, I'm sure, will be fully aware of. If I can just run through a number of the issues on veterans, on combat stress, they have reported just this year that they've seen a 57% increase in the number of referrals to their organisation, just in one year. Now, that could be a good thing. It could be the fact that perhaps former servicemen and women are overcoming the stigma, the fact that they recognise that it's not something to be embarrassed about, so therefore they're more prepared to be forthcoming and get the support that they need. But it could also be an indication perhaps that there is a greater problem. The fact that there is a greater number of people out there who need our support. Now, we need to dig down into the numbers and the motivations as to why that's happening. But it's still clearly an issue, and the support that combat stress will require if they've seen that significant increase in referrals will need to be recognised as well. I've been to see veterans first point at the other end of uh, Princess Street, if they're still there. They provide some excellent work. The fact that it's this kind of first one-stop shop to signpost people on to other services. Not badged as a mental health service, but there to provide people who need mental health support or any other support that they may require. Again, a good service, and the government deserves credit uh, for introducing that. I would like to hear more from the Minister as to how effective the priority treatment scheme has been for those um, former uh, servicemen and women who received um, perhaps an injury um, while they were uh, serving and what kind of extra support they're going to get. Is this just something that's there and is possibly available but nobody actually takes up or actually have people benefited from that service? I'd like to hear from more from the Minister at the end. I'll also be joining Ken McIntosh at the AFLA reception uh, tomorrow night. I think it's a great scheme to provide um, legal services, support for uh, veterans. That's a great scheme. Um, the, the Minister perhaps will also give us an update on the employability. I think you know, it's quite clear that not all veterans are victims. Um, sometimes if you read the newspapers, you think that would certainly be the case. It's not. Um, I know many who have gone on to um, well-paid jobs um, contributing greatly to society, but also to employment. But the, the charity Sorted, that's a collaboration of different um, organisations that have come together to provide an employability scheme. I'd like to see um, what work the government, Scottish Government is doing to work with them. In terms of service men and women, um, just in conclusion, um, the, there is a real problem with servicemen and women who are forced to move around the country to different deployments with getting the proper GP support, dentists, but also getting into the right schools at the right time when their children are uprooted. Again, is the government aware of, if, is that a significant problem just now? And if so, how is he addressing it? I have to give credit to the Scottish Government. I think they're working well with the you UK Government. Close. It was sticky at the beginning, but I think they are now working well, so I pay tribute to the Minister for doing so. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues across the Chamber, I participated in two Armed Forces uh, events on, on Saturday in Hamilton, one organised by the local council, which is the flag raising ceremony, and the other one organised by Voluntary Action South Lanarkshire, which was a coming together of all the organisations that support each other across Lanarkshire. And talking to some of the veterans that were there that day and hearing their stories makes you think about how hard fought our freedoms are. And in taking the march past, I always seemed to be more taken by an RAF uniform, but I think that's more because my father was in the RAF, but maybe the minister would prefer me to say a Royal Marine uniform is, is much nicer. But move, moving on and looking at some of the, the, the organisations that were involved in the event, which was a, a, an awareness raising event in the centre of Hamilton, you know, with lots, lots of people there. We had armed forces there as well, and we had the fire service uh, there as well. And we'd help for heroes, Women's Aid, Sam and the uh, Citizens' Advice Bureau and the um, Armed F Services Advice Project, which is a project, specialist project supported by Poppy Scotland. And, uh, and members in here will, will be aware that I have spoken about uh, this project before um, in a previous debate when the pilot ran in Hamilton. And for, for information, the Armed Services Advice Project, not normally known as ASAP, delivers an information service, it gives advice and it also supports members and their families of all the armed forces community. Um, they are throughout Scotland now and they have a helpline, they do face-to-face -face casework and they cover nine regions. Um, some of the regions that they are now covering, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, Edinburgh and the Lothians, Falkirk, Fife, Inverness, Murray and Nairn, Lanarkshire, Renfrewshire, Stillingshire, Clackmannanshire and Tayside. So they certainly do have a, a great coverage now of the work they do and I would urge anyone um, in any MSPs uh, uh, if they're in their local area to go and see that the work they do because they do a lot of signposts and they do a lot of the things that we've all called for here today um, and if that can be continued then it can only be to the benefit of armed forces service personnel and their families. Um, the the project was started on the 1st of July and in total now they've seen 4,745 individual clients, um, which is a huge amount when you think about it. And the financial gain of that, making sure people got the right benefits they were entitled to, got the right payouts they were entitled to, uh, is sitting right now at £3,241,000, which is a return of £3 for every £1 of funding that has been put in to this project over that period. Now, people come and they've got very, very complex support needs, um, and they come back on multiple occasions. Some of them, you know, have got issues around debt, around addiction, um, and there's many, many um, complicated situations that the advice staff there work with. And over the, the four years of the project, the, dish, the, the issues that's been dealt with, um, it, and these are approximates, is 39% of all issues have been for benefits, 19% to deal with debt, um, housing accounted for about 8% of the issues raised, and financial issues, including grant applications, were 10%, and 7% were for employment. So as you can see straight away, presiding officer, the work that that gets done there, the, the, the wraparound care that gets taken to ensure that people get the absolutely right support. And interestingly, um, the figures on referral have changed slightly as well. Self-referral and word of mouth is now at 40% which is where you want it to be, because sometimes that's the best type of referral you get. Citizen advice referrals are now at 11%. SAFA are able to, um, have been able to uh, um, refer 8% of the people that, that come to them for specific items. The same with the welfare, Veterans Welfare Service and other charities, the Legion, Poppy Scotland and the Armed Forces Welfare Service have all, um, 3 and 4% of their clients have all been referred. But it just shows you that 40% of self-referral is probably just, you know, the, 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 the men and women who have, you know, come back, who are veterans, who are transitioning out, talking to each other, and that can only be a good thing. And one of the projects, that, a new project that has started, and I, I, I laid a motion in Parliament that there was a few weeks ago, and I hope all members have taken the opportunity to sign that, is a new service, which is um, a service working with Police Scotland, um, Alec Ferguson had mentioned in his contribution earlier about 40% of veterans landing in prison. Hopefully this service will prevent some of that. Yep. Sorry, got it wrong? <laughs> uh, uh, ju just a little bit, if I may Alex just correct Ferguson. what the member said. What I, what I drew attention to was the fact that my understanding is the figures show that there was a 40% increase 
uh, last year and the number of veterans going into prison. Uh, th thanks for that clarification. I, I must have just picked you up wrong when I, I took my notes, and I apologise for that. Um, but I think this project will address those very people um, that, that Alec Ferguson spoke about. The work with a, uh, Police Scotland are now working with a wide range of the organisations, specifically ASAP, and now working with the health, helpline. Police Scotland will deal with people, uh, as I say, in a, a wide range of situations, and the biggest issue is about keeping people safe. Some people come to the, the, um, the police um, attention because maybe of other issues going on in their community and then it becomes quite apparent there's maybe a mental health issue there or a post-traumatic stress disorder issue there and now the police have a direct referral to ASAP and again that can only be uh, a very good thing. Early indications are that this project is working extremely well and I just wanted to finish in this year of um, uh, 100 years since the, the anniversary. This is a statement to the House of Commons from um, Prime Minister Herbert Asquith and he said and I quote if I am asked what I am fighting for, I can re reply in two sentences. In the first place, to fulfil a solemn international obligation, an obligation of honour which no self-respecting man could possibly have repudiated. I say, secondly, we are fighting to vindicate the principle that small nationalities are not to be crushed in the defiance of international good faith and at the arbitrary close, will please. of a strong and overmastering power. And I think the Armed Forces Commissioner will uphold all of those standards and support and respect all of our service personnel. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Colin, and I will you to be followed by Richard Baker. Very tight for time, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm too I'm very pleased to have been called to speak in this debate this afternoon. And uh, I do so also, uh, uh, like Alex Ferguson, uh, as a member of the cross-party group on, on veterans, where I've taken a particular interest uh, in the welfare of our armed forces uh, and veterans since my election to this parliament, just as I did when I was a member of the Westminster Parliament, uh, where I was involved in a number of defence-related uh, issues, including, of course, the widely uh, supported but sadly subsequently unsuccessful campaign to save the Black Watch and the other Scottish regiments. That campaign sadly fell on, on deaf ears by the UK government of the day. But it is very fitting, presiding officer, that we are having this debate today in advance of Armed Forces Day being held in Stirling on Saturday and in this year where we remember in particular those who fell in the First World War in the fields of Flanders and beyond. And what a terrible, terrible price was paid by so many millions of young men and what a terrible impact the war had on communities the length and breadth of Scotland and of uh, every country across the European continent and the wider world. And we look back to, as the Minister said, uh, this year to the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings and the bravery of those who came ashore on the beaches of France to liberate a continent. And there really are no words, presiding officer, to properly describe these heroic actions and the sacrifice involved. But what each of us can do is to ensure that those who serve their country are treated with the utmost respect and with dignity when they leave the armed forces. And here in Scotland, it is a matter of some pride, therefore, presiding officer, that we have a dedicated minister for veterans to ensure that as far as we can, with the limited powers that this parliament has, we can support the some 400,000 veterans in Scotland. And as we have heard, the Scottish Government has made significant contributions to Veterans Scotland and through Veterans Scotland to a number of important ex-service charities to support the excellent work of those charities. Uh, we also have had the 2012 Our Commitments Report, or to give it its full title, uh, Our Commitments, Scottish Government Support for the Armed Forces Community in Scotland. And this provides inter alia for a coordinated approach across government to planning for and delivery of devolved services for our armed forces community. And I think it's important, as Christina McKelvey uh, referred to, that we also include within that the uh, families of our, our armed forces and, and veterans, because they play a very significant role uh, as well. Uh, albeit not, of course, in, in the front line. Um, the, uh, there's also provision for regular meetings with Veterans Scotland, and there's also assistance to NHS boards and other public sector providers. And indeed, in the work of the cross-party group, there are recurrent themes, and one of those uh, concerns uh, health uh, matters. So it is very welcome uh, that there is uh, provision for priority NHS treatment for veterans, uh, both serving and retired reservists, with what is defined as a service-related uh, condition. Uh, however, at recent cross-party group meetings, there has been discussion on the parameters of service-related condition, and in particular where mental health uh, issues present, 
which present maybe not immediately, uh, but sometime down the line. And perhaps this is an area that the Veterans Minister could have a look at in conjunction uh, with his ministerial colleagues in the health portfolio to see what can be done to ensure uh, that the implementation of this policy is as clear-cut as it can be for all concerned. Uh, of course, reference has been made to other uh, uh, excellent provision in the health field for veterans, including the specialist mental health services uh, in conjunction with the NHS in combat uh, stress uh, and also the NHS Armed Forces Champion in every NHS board in Scotland. And also there is, has been a leaflet provided uh, to uh, raise understanding amongst GPs about what it means to be a veteran and the kind of issues that could uh, present. In addition to the important area of health, housing, of course, is, is a key area that frequently also is raised at the cross-party group. And I'm pleased to note that there have been a number of initiatives promoted by the Scottish Government, including the introduction of legislation on homelessness to ensure that um, employment and residence connected to the armed forces constitutes a local connection for the purposes of the legislation, that there is priority access to the Scottish Government's low-cost initiative for first-time buyers' shared equity scheme. And indeed, the Minister referred to the housing uh, uh, 50 homes unit, which is in Glasgow, and I believe the Minister also referred to developments in Kernesty. Uh, so that's also to be very welcome, which will include social and transitional housing. Um, another area which also is, has been raised at the cross-party group concerns welfare issues, but of course sadly, although veterans face many considerable challenges in the field of welfare, uh, this Parliament at the present time can do very little about that because we simply do not have welfare powers. They reside at this moment with Westminster, but hopefully not for much longer, further to, I would hope, a yes vote on the 18th of uh, September. We've heard about the uh, champions, uh, veterans champions of the local authorities uh, and I think it might be timely to have a look at that again to see what further uh, awareness could be raised and access facilitated to uh, these champions who do a power of work but I think that their role could be further uh, explained and enhanced to the veterans community that they're there to, uh, to serve. Uh, I would wish uh, finally presenting offer to, officer to uh, 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 wish well the new Scottish Veterans Commissioner, whoever it may be, uh, in their new post uh, that the Scottish Government has created to bring a greater focus to all the areas uh, of uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, this, in my view, acts as a significant marker of the Scottish Government's absolute commitment to do right by veterans in Scotland to ensure that they receive the help they need. The people of Scotland, presiding officer, would expect nothing less. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call Richard Baker to be followed by Graham Day. Six minutes uh, speeches, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by welcoming also this opportunity to recognise the contribution our armed forces have made to our life in Scotland and Britain today. When we look at the recent events commemorating both the First World War and the 70th anniversary of the Normandy landings, this brings back to all of us just what a huge debt of gratitude we owe to all who have served in our armed forces, what they have achieved together. We are, of course, approaching Armed Forces Day, as the Minister mentioned in his contribution, and that will be an important opportunity to celebrate the crucial role our armed forces are carrying out today in protecting our nation, as well as recognising all they have achieved in the past. So it's good we can agree across the chamber in the sentiments uh, in the Scottish Government's motion. And can I join others who uh, have welcomed the progress towards the appointment of a new Scottish Veterans Commissioner? This will be an important role in building new relationships between all those who work for our, our veterans and ensure also that the Scottish Government can play its role in contributing to that important work. We are reminded in this Parliament each year of the vital role played by charities who work with veterans through the work of Poppy Scotland and the chance we have to commemorate the contribution of our armed forces on Remembrance Day. But it's important that throughout the year we are aware of the work which is done by our armed forces and for our veterans. And I'm sure all of us have met veterans for whom the transition to civilian life has not been an easy one for a whole host of reasons, those for whom experiences of combat has left mental and physical scars. And this underlines the importance of the, of the support uh, they receive, both from those organisations and charities working with veterans and the need for our public services as well to provide the right support for veterans. I'm sure on this issue, uh, the Veterans Commissioner will also have an important role to play. 
but of course while recognising the challenges uh, many veterans face, which the Minister outlined in his speech. It's also important to recognise the great contribution to our communities so many veterans make today. And it was right to emphasise this too, because as Ken McIntosh uh, talked about in his contribution, uh, he said this stereotypes need to be challenged, and a number of members have made this important point as well. As a member for the North East, you'd expect me to talk of the vital role played in our community by the Gordon Highlanders, and Gordon Highlander veterans today make a great contribution to our area and our local communities. The majority of the regiment's ranks were made up of men from Aberdeen and the North East who fought on battlefields across the world. In August 1949, the regiment was given the freedom of the city of Aberdeen. So Winston Churchill said, there is no doubt they are the finest regiment in the world. So in October 2011, I was privileged to attend the unveiling of a commemorative statue to the Gordon Highlanders Regiment, commissioned by Aberdeen City Council at the city's castle gate. The sculpture of two soldiers is indeed a magnificent statue, and it was unveiled by Prince Charles, who had served as a colonel-in-chief of the Gordon Highlanders and as a patron of the Gordon Highlanders Museum. The museum itself plays an important role in the city, and a tremendous amount of work has been invested in making it the excellent resource it is today. Not only is it a place to visit and learn about the Gordon Highlanders, but it's a centre for learning and research as well, to focus on the contribution uh, made uh, by the soldiers in the past and also uh, to ensure that it reminds us of the contribution we must make to the lives of veterans uh, today. At this stage, presiding officer, I particularly like to pay tribute to the tremendous work done by Lieutenant General Sir Peter Graham, formerly commanding officer of the 1st Battalion of the Gordon Highlanders and subsequently General Officer Commanding Scotland, who's been instrumental in making the museum the great success it is today. It's a personal mission to helping our veterans in today's community as well. And as important as the museum is, is in celebrating the history of the Gordon Highlanders. Today, the museum also offers activities for families and children and learning experiences for pupils to find out more about what life would have been like for soldiers in the Gordon Highlanders. And, of course, this outreach work is very important for our younger generations, as it is for all of us who have lived in times of a relative uh, peace and, fortunately, uh, have not had those experiences our, our grandparents had. So we understand better how that peace was secured and empathise more with the crucial role our armed forces play uh, today. Uh, this work of the Gordon Highlanders Museum receives fantastic support from our local community in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. And so it's right that on a broader level, uh, the work of Poppy Scotland, Erskine and other charities working with veterans across Scotland receives our support from this parliament and the Scottish Government as well. And so I'm pleased that's exactly the kind of approach the Minister has outlined in his contribution and certainly is outlined in the motion we are debating this afternoon. So it's good that the Scottish Government is taking a strategic approach to that work, that we can look to progress with the appointment of the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, so that as a society we not only ensure our veterans have the gratitude uh, they so richly deserve from us, but crucially the support so many of them need from our communities and from our public services as well. Many thanks. And the last open debate speaker is Graham Day. After that, we will move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The, uh, the fairness and decency of a society can be measured in a variety of ways, not the least of these being how it treats its most vulnerable citizens and, of course, those to whom it owes the most. And veterans are one group that absolutely comes under the heading to those we owe the most. If we're honest, I'm not sure we can, as a society, say that historically we've done all that we might have done for them. However, in Scotland over recent years, that has been changing. As we all know, Scotland has a long and proud military history shaped by the efforts of those serving past and present in our armed forces. Like Christina McKelvey, I should perhaps declare an interest in that three successive generations on my mother's side served in the military, including my grandfather, who won the military cross while serving with the Gordon Highlanders during the Second World War. We owe a tremendous amount to the men and women of our Navy, Army and Air Force, and it's essential that we do all that we can to help and support them when they look to return to civilian life, whether at the conclusion of an extended period of service or as a result of injuries sustained in the line of duty. We may not always agree with the conflicts in which our armed forces might have been ordered to participate, but that, in terms of our duty of care to them, is frankly irrelevant. Having placed them in harm's way and all too often subjected them to witnessing events and experiencing traumas which can leave a lasting legacy, all too often one which, as Alec Ferguson mentioned, 
uh, takes time to fully manifest itself. We must, as a society, be prepared to provide the appropriate support to these individuals as they seek to reintegrate into everyday society. As we have heard, there are approximately 400,000 veterans in Scotland, proportionately a larger number than other areas of the UK, which of course presents a challenge to government, national and local. And with 2,000 personnel annually leaving the armed forces and seeking either to return or move to Scotland, then that challenge will become even greater, albeit, as the Minister pointed out, the vast majority of ve veterans integrate back into civilian life without significant difficulty. I do not think there is any doubting the integrity of the response from the Scottish Government to this. With £600,000 having gone to ex-service charities from the Scottish Veterans Fund since 2008, a further £200,000 to Veterans Scotland to improve support for vets over the next two years, £2 million dedicated to the new National Specialist Prosthetics Service, and £1.2 million for the provision of specialist mental health services, a £2.3 million grant to SVHA to provide 50 homes in Glasgow, extending the concessionary travel scheme to include forces veterans with mobility problems, and of course the pending appointment of a Scottish Veterans uh, Commissioner, the Government has very much backed its words of support for veterans with firm action. I am pleased to say that at local authority level, in my own constituency of Angus South, Angus Council is also leading by example, particularly in the area of housing. As the Minister noted in moving the motion, Angus Council is currently building a number of wheelchair accessible uh, properties to be allocated to veterans in Carnoustie. The demolition of the old Camus House care home, which the Minister got behind the controls of a JCB to symbolically at least commence uh, some months ago, has paved the way for the locating of 11 council properties to be made available to the uh, general uh, populace. And in conjunction with the Houses for Heroes charity, five for use by injured veterans. Uh, Angus Council has provided a third of the funding in the House Houses for Heroes charity of the rest. And I can tell the Minister that the, the project has progressed to the stage where uh, the foundations for the houses are now being laid. President officer, this really is a project to be commended because it integrates housing provision for our veterans within the community. Whilst the grouping of veterans housing uh, can offer an obvious peer support mechanism, it is important at the same time that we do not in any way ghettoise this. The message sent out must be that those locating to such facilities are very much part of the wider community and welcomed into it. I share the Chairman of Houses for uh, Heroes, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Callender's opinion that the partnership established with Angus Council is an example to other areas in Scotland. Uh, and of course, the Council has gone beyond that with the appointment of a veterans champion in the shape of former Black Watch Major Councillor Ronnie Proctor and the establishment of Veterans First, which provides contacts and advice for vets on topics ranging from housing to health to finding new employment and expanding their skill set. And can I make the point, in case anyone thinks I'm praising Angus Council, because it's SNP led? Councillor Proctor is a Conservative. His predecessor was, if I correctly recall, a Lib Dem. And that, I think, reflects the cross party support for the veterans cause which exists in Angus and judging by today's contributions around this chamber. So Angus is an area is doing its bit, as is the Scottish Government. And the unusual degree of consensus within this afternoon's debate, I think, has made crystal clear this Parliament's commitment to supporting our veterans community. But as the Minister noted earlier this year, we cannot rest on our laurels. More can be done and will need to be done in the future. However, the message which I think goes out from this debate, presiding officer, is that the Scottish Parliament is fully aware of its responsibilities to veterans and fully committed to meeting these. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Alex Johnston. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is an important debate and one that falls at an appropriate time. Uh, I rise, of course, to support the motion in the name of the Minister, uh, and I would like to add my weight to the comments that he made when he paid fulsome praise uh, to those who have served this country over generations in the past. Uh, with the Armed Forces Day only a few days away, uh, and with the memories of the D-Day commemoration still in our minds, uh, I think it is very important that we do not forget the debt of gratitude that we owe to the many men and women who have served this country in military roles in the past. It is, however, something that we must take seriously as a responsibility. We have heard a number of people talk in this debate about the disadvantages that some uh, people have on discharge. However, we must emphasise that most veterans fit in very easily when they come out of the armed forces. It is, in fact, the case that many of those who choose to serve their country are the brightest and the best and naturally acquire skills which they can take into the community thereafter. I personally know of companies serving the oil and gas industry in the North East 
who are willing to recruit anyone who leaves the engineers or the signals regiment uh, and will take them at the drop of a hat, uh, so qualified and so able they are at the jobs they do. I also welcome the fact that the Minister has taken the opportunity today uh, to commit the Government to further support for the cadet forces. Uh, my memories of uh, being in Stonehaven in the late 1970s at nine o'clock on a Friday evening were that you didn't see any teenagers that were out of uniform. We had the Air Training Corps, we had the Sea Cadets and we had the Army Cadets all mixing in the square, making their way home from uh, the meetings that night. And I believe that the cadet forces play an important role and can play a more important role in encouraging our young people to take a responsible and positive attitude towards their role in society. Uh, there can only be good comes of that. However, uh, as we move on, the, it has to be said that this Scottish Parliament has shown a keen record in uh, showing greater emphasis in veterans' issues. And I remain greatly encouraged by the work done by successive Scottish governments and also the work done by the cross-party group on armed forces veterans, uh, which has done an excellent job of engaging with veterans' organisations. I pay tribute to Alec Ferguson for the particular work that he has done. I'm also delighted uh, to have been able to sponsor a, a, a reception for veterans housing charities, which took place in 2012, uh, a group of organisations which uh, achieve so much, uh, but yet need to learn to work more closely together. Um, Councillor uh, Graham Day has already mentioned uh, the fact that Angus Council has been heavily involved in putting together projects to provide homes for veterans. The project in Carnoustie, I think, exemplifies the holistic approach, which included engaging with veterans charities and the Scottish Government. Uh, and I'd like to pay tribute to Councillor Jim Miller, Miller another Conservative, who was the councillor uh, convener of the Neighbourhood Services Committee, which drove through that project in its early stages. But this leads me to one other thing I wanted to say, and that relates uh, to the important point of cooperation between organisations. I mentioned that the, there was a proliferation of charities in the veterans' housing area, but the proliferation of responsibilities that lie within covering uh, for veterans when they need assistance uh, is something which can, in fact, work as a negative rather than a positive. I would like to see greater cooperation and partnership working, not only with the Scottish Government and local government, but NHS and the third sector, so that we can bring these activities together in a coordinated way. Uh, it is a safety net that we need to provide, and sometimes that safety net allows people to fall through. Uh, it should be possible with the level of activity and support that we already have to avoid that problem in future, and a little work could go a long way in achieving that objective. It's also vital that we don't allow our veterans to go under the radar uh, and ensu ensure that there is uh, an understanding of what needs to be done on their behalf. Our understanding of the issues facing veterans increases all the time. And we must do everything possible to make sure that legislation and assistance keeps pace with the changing needs of our veteran population. They've done so much for us, we must do everything we can for them. The appointment of a veterans commissioner is something which uh, I think will go on to prove itself as an appropriate action. I think the words I used when the announcement was made was that I hope that having a, a minister uh, for veterans with such recent military experience was something that would lead to improvements and strengths uh, in our performance in that area. If we have a veterans commissioner, the right person in the right place, I believe that many of these problems can be brought together and, and solved. The final problem is one which I've mentioned previously uh, and would like to mention once again, and that is the pressure that our veteran services are going to experience in the next few years. It's a challenge of our times that with the military withdrawal from the Middle East and the removal of troops from Germany to be stationed back here, coupled with the downsizing of our military forces in some cases, demands on veterans' uh, support mechanisms will be at their height 
for the next few years. It is important that we ensure that that support is made available when necessary and ta tailored to, in order to deal with that bump in demand. Thank you very much. And I call Mark Griffin. Seven minutes maximum, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to close the debate as I opened uh, by restating the continued support uh, we give to our armed forces personnel um, and veterans. I don't think it's, it's any surprise that there's such a strong su support within um, Scotland for our armed forces personnel and veterans. I think that comes over loud and clear when you hear from um, personal contributions, Christina McKelvey and Graham Day, who spoke about um, the, the military background that, that they have in their families, as, as I've heard from members in, in previous debates. And I, I certainly don't think that is the exception. I think if you speak to almost anyone in Scotland, they can point to some um, military experience or, or history in their family. And that is the foundation of, of the support that we give to our armed forces and veterans in Scotland. And I, I think we do owe a, a debt of gratitude to those, those armed forces members and veterans. And we'll be able to mark some of those um, key events from World War I over the next few years. Um, I met with Norman Drummond, the chair of the Scottish Commemorations Panel, who was able to outline the, the key dates and events to commemorate um, the ones with a strongly Scottish dimension. And I look forward to, to, to attending as many of those events as possible over, over the next few years. Those seven in our armed forces are asked to make massive personal sacrifices in their human rights and ultimately give up their right to life in the service of the nation. It's only um, right in return that, that governments and we as a nation value, respect and support our armed forces. And this culminates in the annual commemoration of Armistice Day, where we stop to remember those who have given their lives in action so that we can enjoy the, the freedom that we experience today. Members will know that I spent some time myself in the Territorial Army, and I have to say that I haven't had the same experience in any other situation in life. And while I went through all that training, I reserve as can, I didn't deploy um, because of other commitments, but I can't even begin to imagine that level of intensity um, and commitment to their fellow soldiers, those in the front line will have, will have experienced. Um, it's hard to, to listen to people who have served in, in frontline action and, and speak about some of their, their experiences. And it's easier to understand um, the, the sort of conditions that, that people often come, come home with. It, you can only imagine how isolated sometimes someone must feel when they're discharged from the armed forces after um, being in such stressful situations alone, perhaps with with no family um, and missing that close bond that they, that they had with, with people they, they, they fought with. It, it's of vital importance then that the advice and support services are in place for former service personnel to adjust to living in mainstream society and that governments continue to plan, coordinate and deliver support and advice services from the private, public and voluntary sectors for ex-service personnel and their families. And I hope that the, the pending appointment of the, the Veterans Commissioner will achieve that and, and work to, to pull together um, the work of government and those um, voluntary organisations and, and charities across, across Scotland. I also welcome local authorities who have appointed veterans champions and are starting to deliver positive changes like in North Lanarkshire who have amended their housing policy to recognise the, the priority needs of homeless ex-service personnel and their families who have just been discharged from duty. I will take the point from Alex Ferguson that um, there is no point in um, having that armed forces champion if, if no one is able to access them, if it is not publicised and that if members of the armed forces community or, or veterans um, don't know who that is uh, and find it difficult to, to make contact with them. Um, we should continue to support uh, the work done by, by many charities and organisations across Scotland, and we've heard many examples of, of those today. 
we are committed, as I said, in the opening to working on a cross-party basis to ensure that our veterans and their families receive the support and the, that they need and deserve. And in particular, we recognise that our service personnel often need support with that transition to, to civilian life, particularly finding housing and, um, and employment and recognition of um, the impact that their tour of duty can sometimes have, um, but also not just the impact, but the skills they bring to communities. That, that was raised um, repeatedly during the debate in terms of Alex Johnson pointing out um, the skills that are in demand um, from, from companies. Linda Fabiani pointing out the, the contribution um, ex RAF uh, personnel are able to make towards inter international development and aid after they, after they leave their tour of duty. And that's not, not to be forgotten. I've spoken about what we can do as individual MSPs by supporting the organisations and charities that are operating in our, in our own areas. Myself doing my, my veteran surgery, Ken McIntosh um, flagged up the, the Parliament football team's match against the, the RAF. Um, I know that the, the trophy is no longer in the, the Scottish Parliament. I don't really think that was because myself or the minister weren't there. I, um, with greatest respect, I think it was because there was a couple of uh, members of Colsyth Amateurs football team that went up there along with me <laughs> to shore up um, the leaky defence in the, in the Parliament team. Um, President officer, this has been a, another good consensual debate on the need to support our armed forces and veterans community in Scotland. I'll close again as I open by acknowledging the debt of gratitude that Scotland owes to those who have served in defence of freedom in our armed forces and that we will be supporting the government motion at decision time and that we're willing, as always, to work and with the government on a cross-party basis to support veterans in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Keith Brown to wind up the debate. Minister, you have maximum nine minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's fairly clear from the contributions that we've had that there is a unanimous admiration for our armed forces community, and that doesn't surprise me. Although I think, as I've said in previous debates, uh, members should be aware of how much that's appreciated by the armed forces community themselves, seeing that level of consensus and unanimity. As we've said, many members have said, every day our armed forces are there at the ready, trained and equipped to do what's necessary. And they're based in our communities, they contribute to our economies and they live as our neighbours and our friends. And they are an integral part of our society. Rather than read the remarks I was going to, to make, I'll try and answer as many of the points that were made as possible. And apologies if I don't. But if I don't mention the points that were made by members, please be assured that we, are, we will be taking those up. Um, first of all, to uh, Mark Griffin, uh, to Dave Stewart, uh, to Alec Ferguson and to Willie Rennie, I'm very pleased about the consensus there is on the need to have the uh, Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme extended to the devolved administrations. I think for the reasons that Willie Rennie himself said, which means that we ourselves can become more familiar with the work of the Armed Forces by actually experiencing it. And if members, the members I've mentioned are happy to do, I'm more than happy to put round a letter which I'll take to see uh, Anna Subri with next week when I make that uh, case. I'll send it out and if members feel able to sign that, that would be great. Sure. David uh, Stewart. Thank you, Mr. I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way, and I strongly support the Minister's view on the Armed Forces Scheme. Um, as I said earlier, I was, I was a great privilege to have spent two terms with the RAF in my time in Westminster. Uh, would the, has the Minister any plans to meet Sir Neil Thorne, who chairs the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme? And if not, could suggest he does meet him to talk about the costs and practicalities of extending the scheme to the Scottish Parliament? Minister. Uh, I think that's a very worthwhile suggestion and undertake to, to look into that. Our previous representations have been made at ministerial and MOD level, but we will take that uh, point forward. I can also very quickly pay tribute to uh, Alec Ferguson and also to uh, Annabelle Ewing for their work on the cross-party group, which uh, I was a founder member of in the last parliament and I think does very uh, good work. Uh, Alec Ferguson made, uh, I think, a very important point about duplication amongst the charities. I think it's a, a fine point, but of course his concern last time with the appointment of the Commissioner was that the Commissioner himself did not usurp or undermine the role of the charity. So I think course, I take on board the point that he makes, and I know the point very well, 500 plus charities, ensuring there's not duplication. I think that's going to have to be for the charities themselves to do, and it's best done by them to look at what they're doing, how can they maximise the, uh, and focus their, their work on that, rather than anything that would be imposed either by government or by the Commissioner. Happy to give way. Alex Ferguson. 
I'm grateful to the Minister again for giving way, and, and I absolutely understand what he says. Would he, would he not think there might be a role for the Commissioner in, in, in guiding people towards that coming together in order to address that problem? In other words, does he not think there may be a need for a sort of central, um, a central focus uh, on what these very disparate and diverse charities need to do? Minister. Well, well, of course, the charities themselves are governed by Oscar as much as they are by anybody else. But uh, I think the point that he makes is a well-made one. But I think it's really down to Veterans Scotland, which is the organisation that would bring those together to take on uh, th that role. And I'm happy to see that happen. Um, a number of points made by members. First of all, Ken McIntosh mentioned the hunting Stuart tartan. And uh, he will know, of course, that our near neighbours across at the palace also have the ancient hunting Stuart as their tartan, a very fine tartan it is as well. There was also a mention by Christina McKelvey of how attractive the Air Force uniform was. And it is indeed a very smart uniform. But I would have to say there's nothing to compare with the Lovitz and the Greenberries of Marine Commandos. But I may be prejudiced in that regard. Uh, I can also say that uh, although it's fiction, um, if people want the chance to see what uh, going back to D-Day, which you mentioned at the start, was actually like, I, I would commend, in my view, uh, the Band of Brothers series, which is currently on TV, which is underpinned by the real-life experiences and testimony of people who actually experienced that as a very good idea of what the sacrifice that was made in 1944 uh, was all about. Now, a number of members mentioned um, private, the private sector and the help that they've done. Could I also mention Malcolm's, the transport group, uh, first group in Aberdeen, and also Vine, uh, an organisation which I went to with Angus MacDonald uh, yesterday in Grangemouth, which is the Chambers of Commerce coming together to get veterans into new enterprises, an entrepreneurial aspect to making sure veterans can get uh, fulfilling careers after they leave the service. All very worthwhile um, organisations doing great work with their veterans in a way that's fairly um, uh, understated. Um, Alec Johnson said that the oil and gas industry uh, in particular uses uh, people, including signalers, um, to a great extent in the North Sea. If only I had known that as an ex-signaler in 1983, my experience is not that recent as you can imagine. Uh, but if I had known that, then of course the Parliament could have been spared my contributions because I could have gone off to a career in that. But it is it's very important. The, oil, the, the North Sea sector in particular is, uh, I know from my own experience, recently going back to 4-5 Commando, is often the first choice of many people leaving the forces and they're looking for training support and diving support and things which will help them move into that area and we've been trying to help them uh, in relation to that. Uh, Willie Rennie raised the important point about the priority treatment scheme. And I would say to him that we don't gather these uh, statistics. That would be uh, quite a, an administrative burden on the boards concerned. But uh, I will ask the NHS chief executives to look at this further to see what we can find out. Uh, and again, with the appointment of the commissioner very shortly, we'll have a, a central focus for undertaking that kind of work. And the, the underlying point, of course, is that uh, we should, when we take forward these initiatives, make sure they actually work and that they've been taken up. So I understand uh, that point. Uh, it was a very good contribution, I thought, from Graham Day, who mentioned his uh, grandfather's time in the uh, Gordon Highlanders. And it's worth saying that uh, having won the military cross, none of us should underestimate what it takes to win uh, a military cross. And it does uh, exemplify the point also made by Richard Baker about the fantastic record that the Gordon Highlanders uh, themselves uh, have. Um, I would also welcome the support for all parties uh, to the many of the initiatives which have taken forward and I think the emerging consensus in terms of the Commissioner, I think the points which were raised in the past and it's absolutely right that these debates, although they're fairly consensual in nature, do throw up challenges. Uh, it's absolutely right that they do that and so I was happy to hear the challenges to the points about the Commissioner and you know, some of the concerns that it might usurp some of the role of Veterans Scotland and I think we've tried to lay those fears hopefully uh, satisfactorily but it's, it's encouraging to see that level of um, consensus because I think it is something which is really appreciated as said by the veterans community themselves when they see their elected representatives uh, actually uh, endorsing that kind of consensus. I think I would also say that in relation uh, to some of the organisations, I've mentioned one or two of them, one or two I haven't mentioned, although somebody else did, was the Scottish Veterans Residence just across the road from here, also represented in the public gallery today, uh, and the other veterans housing providers who deliver very high quality accommodation and uh, all manner of support uh, in situations that make a tremendous difference to the lives of so uh, many veterans. I think the points I would make uh, in relation to whether it's mental health, um, uh, proliferation of mental, mental health issues, whether it's in relation to housing issues, uh, unemployment, or even uh, representation within the judicial, judicial system, 
I think what's extremely important in relation to this is to be accurate, because uh, we can overstate the problem sometimes, and if we do that, we're not doing uh, right by our veterans. We have to try and be accurate about the extent to which the vast majority do take up um, a viable employment and have a very successful career upon leaving the forces. And that's very important to realise. Neither should we underestimate it, because if we do that, then we run the danger of not providing the services that are required. Now, just on that, Alex Ferguson raised a figure of 40 per cent increase in the number of veterans in prisons. Uh, now, this comes from an FOI release to the Daily Record, which has done a tremendous job in highlighting some of the issues that face our veterans. And that gave a monthly self-reported figure in the Scottish Prison Service Statistical Bulletin, uh, up from around 150 in 2011-12 to 2012-13. Uh, and they advise that it's too early to say if there's any trend which is underpinned by that data, as the data has only been collected since 2011 and also is self-reported, so they can't yet say whether this reflects a real increase. It's an important issue, and we have to continue to monitor that. And I think the work which I mentioned at Veterans Scotland, sorry, Veterans First Point, are undertaking in relation to this will add to our understanding of that. So, just to conclude, presiding officer, I, as I say, the Scottish government will continue to work with the military, the ex-service charities, and the service providers. And I would say that work is easier to undertake when you have the level of consensus and unanimity that we have in the chamber. And I look forward to the ideas and the new thinking of the Veterans Commissioner. I believe that appointment will be very well received when it's announced. We are all working in partnership and pulling in the same direction. And as we've all said, we owe our armed forces community our best efforts, our best endeavours, and our best wishes. And I think if we continue to work together then we can work together to the point where Scotland becomes the best country in the world uh, to be a veteran. If we can aim for that very high standard, then we'll do well by our veterans. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes the debate on support for armed forces and veteran communities in Scotland, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10430 in the name of John Swinney, on appointments to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Can I invite members who wish to contribute to this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you have eight minutes in which to do so. Uh, President Officer, I am pleased to seek Parliament's endorsement today of the Scottish Government's plans to establish an independent Scottish Fiscal Commission, as well as Parliament's approval of my nominations for appointment to the Commission. In doing so, I thank the Finance Committee for the very thorough inquiry it held into proposals for the creation of a Scottish Fiscal Commission after I announced my intention to establish such a body in evidence to the Finance Committee in May 2013. The Finance Committee's report has informed the Scottish Government's thinking on this issue, and I record my um, thanks to the Finance Committee for the role it has played in scrutinising my nominations for appointment to the Commission. The creation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is an, another important milestone in the journey to enhance Scotland's fiscal powers. There is widespread international recognition that independent fiscal commissions play a vital role in ensuring the robustness and credibility of a country's fiscal framework. I believe that there is similarly wide consensus across the Parliament that the Scottish Fiscal Commission will be a significant and welcome addition to Scotland's fiscal framework. The Commission will play the key role in providing independent scrutiny of Scottish Government forecasts of receipts from land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax, and also in further assessing the economic determinants underpinning forecasts of non-domestic rates income in Scotland. This will provide Parliament and the public with assurance over the reasonableness and the integrity of the Scottish Government's tax forecasts, which will underpin a proportion of the expenditure to be set out in our draft budget for the first time this autumn. I believe this remit provides a proportionate response to the relatively modest devolution of fiscal powers under the Scotland Act 2012. We will, of course, keep the Commission's remit under review, and I intend to review the role of the Commission in relation to the Scottish Rate of Income Tax prior to its planned introduction in April 2016. It is my intention that the scope of the Commission will expand in line with the Parliament's tax raising and borrowing powers. I intend to bring forward legislation within the present parliamentary term to give the Commission a basis in statute, but it will initially operate on a non-statutory basis. I am strongly of the view that it is critical to the effectiveness of the Commission that it is independent of the Scottish Government and that it is seen and understood to be so. I have taken actions to secure the independence of individual members and the structural and operational independence of the Commission while it operates on a non-statutory basis. 
Turning first to the independence of individual members, I willingly accepted the recommendation made by the France Committee that Parliament should have a role in scrutinising my nominations for appointment to the Commission. Um, I will also make appointments for single fixed terms. The purpose of that is to ensure that at no stage will the, either the Chair or members of the Commission feel in any way um, restricted in the commentary they can apply to the issues in connection with the forecasts that are put forward from the Government um, for in any way considering whether they would be eligible for reappointment for the further term in office. And the fact that individuals would serve only single fixed terms is, I think, a significant foundation of the independence of the Fiscal Commission. As I explained to the Finance Committee last week, the Chair and members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission will be subject to a Code of Conduct based on the Model Code of Conduct for members of devolved public bodies, which was approved by Parliament in December 2013. This will ensure that Commission members are subject to the highest standards of conduct expected by Parliament, including procedures for registering and declaring any potential conflicts of interest. The Commission will also be structurally and operationally independent of the Scottish Government. The Commission will, report, will provide reports to Parliament and to the public on the reasonableness of tax revenue forecasts prepared by the Scottish Government. The Commission will decide what analytical and secretariat support it requires and where it will obtain that support. Crucially, Scottish Government analysts will not be seconded to work for the Commission. The University of Glasgow will provide an independent base for the Commission, and I am grateful to the Principal of the University for his support in this regard. I will ensure that the Commission is appropriate resource to fulfil its functions, providing a modest budget which the Commission can deploy to support its work. And as I indicated to the Finance Committee last week, um, if the Commission comes to me to indicate that they believe they require resources beyond the initial estimation that I have made of an annual budget of £20,000, then I will, of course, consider that sympathetically to ensure the Commission has the resources at its disposal to properly exercise the functions that it will have been allocated. The Commission will have three part-time members, one of whom will serve as chair. I have nominated three highly respected, skilled and authoritative individuals to serve on the Commission, and I invite Parliament to approve these appointments on the recommendation of the Finance Committee. I have nominated Susan Rice to serve as Chair of the Commission. Susan Rice is a distinguished member of Scotland's business community and will bring a wealth of commercial experience to the Commission. She is a chartered banker, managing director of Lloyds Banking Group Scotland and, crucially, um, has been a member of the Court of the Bank of England, uh, chairing the Bank's Audit and Re Risk Committee, demonstrating her ability to operate at a very senior level uh, within the private uh, sector. Um, and to ensure that through her wide interests uh, she is able to draw to the work of the Commission an accomplished record of private, public and third sector service into the bargain. I have also nominated two renowned ac academic economists, Professor Andrew Hughes-Hallett and Professor Campbell Leith, to serve as members of the Commission, both of whom have been instrumental in much of the thinking across the world on the establishment of fiscal commissions that have been of relevance in supporting the work of individual governments as they have established bodies of this nature. Professor Hughes Hallett is jointly Professor of Economics and Public Policy at George Mason University and Professor of Economics at St Andrews University. Professor Campbell Leith is Professor of Macroeconomics at the University of Glasgow and along with Professor Hughes Hallett, an academic authority on fiscal commissions and fiscal rules. In considering my nominations for appointment to the Commission, I gave full consideration to the potential for conf conflicts of interest to arise or be reasonably perceived to arise between membership of the Commission and other offices or roles held by nominees. And particular attention has been drawn to the uh, membership of the Council of Economic Advisers that is held by Susan Rice and Professor Hughes Hallett. I think it is important to recall, Presiding Officer, that the individuals that I have nominated to serve on the Fiscal Commission are individuals with formidable and broad expertise who have been involved in a multiplicity of different functions in a number of different respects. They have built up these uh, reputations, they have built up these records of service based on the integrity of their actions at all times. And I have been at pains to demonstrate to the Finance Committee the very clear separation of role and function that would exist between the Council of Economic Advisers, who would have no role and no locus in scrutinising at any stage 
the fiscal forecast that will be made by the Scottish Government in relation to the uh, responsibilities of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. There can be no doubt that these three individuals will together form a strong and independent Scottish Fiscal Commission which can be relied upon to hold the Scottish Government to account for the tax forecast that we publish in our budget documents. And I move that Parliament uh, endorses the Government's plans to establish a Fiscal Commission and to support the recommendation of the Finance Committee that the Scottish Government nominations to the Commission be approved. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 10430.2. Six minutes, please, Mr Brown. Deputy Presiding Officer, I am very grateful. On these benches, we welcome the setting up of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, an expert body that scrutinises and challenges government forecasts can only be a good thing. Sometimes there is a natural optimism bias of government of any stripe, and having scrutiny of that I think is helpful, and it allows that optimism to be challenged carefully. All three of the nominees put forward by the Scottish Government, in my view, are more than qualified for the roles they've been put forward for. They have the knowledge, the relevant experience, and the skill set required to do the job. That is not in doubt. That was never in doubt. And the Cabinet Secretary is right to put the comments about them that he has done in his opening remarks. The issue, though, from this side of the chamber, Deputy Presiding, though, is this. This independent Scottish Fiscal Commission will only have three part-time commissioners. Yet two out of the three nominations also currently serve on the First Minister's Council of Economic Advisers. In our view, there is a potential conflict and certainly a perception of a conflict between an advisory role on the one hand and a scrutiny role on the other. Two of the three nominations would be simultaneously, and that word is important, they will be doing this simultaneously, advising the Scottish Government on economic levers via the Council and then challenging and scrutinising the Scottish Government on the application of at least some of those economic levers on the other hand. It's worth looking at the work of the existing Council of Economic Advisers, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a fairly small body with only nine members, and it is attended, I think, in every case by the First Minister and in almost every case by the Cabinet Secretary for Sustainable Growth. From looking at the minutes, it is also clear that there are regular engagements outside of the formal meetings between members of the Council of Economic Advisers and the Scottish Government, and in particular the Scottish Government's Chief Economist's Office. How regular, we do not know. We just know from the minutes that it is regular. Some of the items, though, I think come extremely close to some of the work that might be done by a fiscal commission. For example, in the September meeting of 2012, the Cabinet Secretary outlined a progress report on that year's draft budget, the budget for 2013-14. That budget approach was discussed, and this was two weeks before the draft budget was presented to Parliament. I think it is highly likely, Deputy Presiding Officer, if a draft budget is being presented to the Council of Economic Advisers, then they will naturally want to look at items of expenditure, and going forward, they will naturally want to look at the revenue. They will want to look at non-domestic rates, the landfill tax, and no doubt the Land and Buildings Transactions Act too. Economic levers is a standing item on the agenda of the Council of Economic Advisers, and indeed it is one of only three core areas of work that they do. So this is a powerful body. This is a body that clearly has influence, and again, within the minutes, the Chair noted the welcome progress by the Government in responding to its input. And one of those areas, of course, was the set potential setting up of the Scottish Fiscal Commission itself. Deputy Presiding Officer, this new body with a challenge function needs to be and needs to be seen to be completely independent of government. The Cabinet Secretary said that himself in his opening remarks where he says it needs to be seen and understood to be independent. In our view, that is a difficult thing to do when two of the three members 
at the same time hold advisory roles with the same government. The equivalent body in London, the OBR, has faced criticism about its independence and specifically from this Scottish Government and even more specifically from this very same Cabinet Secretary who said on the record to the Finance Committee, given that the arrangement operates on the basis of secondment from the Treasury to the OBR, there is a justifiable degree of scepticism about how far from government the office is. This is the case put forward by the Cabinet Secretary when a back office function was shared between the Treasury and the OBR. What we are talking about today are the decision makers of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the heads of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, at the same time holding advisory roles with the Scottish Government. In concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, of course the Scottish Government can use its majority to force this through Parliament. But I believe it has made an error in suggesting that there is no perception of a conflict. We think there is a perception of a conflict if you are advising on Monday and then scrutinising on Tuesday. It's more difficult still when that applies to two out of the three members who would find themselves in that dual role. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I invite the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government to reflect carefully upon the amendment, to reflect carefully upon the arguments that we have made, and I close simply by moving the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee. Five minutes, please, Mr thank, Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee in this debate on the establishment of a Scottish Fiscal Commission and appointment of Lady Susan Rice, Professor Andrew Hughes-Hallett and Professor Campbell Leith to serve on that body. The establishment of a Scottish Fiscal Commission was put to the Committee by the Cabinet Secretary in May last year. In order to consider the options for establishing such a body, the Committee undertook an inquiry in November and December 2013. As part of this, we heard evidence from a range of economists and individuals with experience of fiscal bodies. The Committee's considerations benefited greatly from the experience and expertise of these witnesses, and I'd like to place on record our appreciation of their contribution. One of the issues we addressed was the requirement that formal safeguards be put in place to protect the independence of the Commission. Amongst those safeguards is the way in which appointments to the Commission are made. As members know, we have an established process for public appointments in Scotland, regulated under legislation and overseen by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary agreed with the Committee's recommendation that appointments will be regulated in this way once the Commission is established as a statutory body. In addition, given the nature of this body, the view of both the Committee and the Government is that the Parliament's consent to those appointments is required. In giving this consent, the Parliament should have regard to Finance Committee recommendations. The Committee's report takes account of both oral and written evidence provided by the nominees and the Cabinet Secretary. The purpose of this evidence taking was to provide Parliament with an opportunity to consider the professional experience and competence of the individuals nominated for appointment. As these are the first appointments to the Commission, the evidence also assisted the Committee to understand more about the issues that will need to be considered by Commission members before they can commence their work. These include the specific remit of the Commission and the staffing and analytical resources they will require to be able to fulfil that remit. The Committee's report also highlights the importance of transparency in the Commission's commentary on the Scottish Government forecasts. The Committee is therefore of the view that any provisional forecast in which the Commission comments should be provided alongside the final forecast with an explanation provided for any differences between the two. This will be important in ensuring that both the Members of Parliament and interested observers are able to understand the interaction between the Commission and the Government. Crucially, this will show how the Government's forecasting may be revised in light of or informed by the Commission's commentary. It would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary respond to this recommendation in his summing up. Turning to the evidence the Committee took from one of the nominees, the range of issues we explored included the individual's previous experience, what they view as immediate priorities to the Commission and how the Commission should operate, particularly with a view to demonstrating its independence. The nominees each brought individual perspective to these questions. That is, of course, expected, as a collective view cannot be reached until the Commission is established. Development of the Commission's remit and agreement of a memorandum of understanding are still to take place. The Committee looks forward to continuing its scrutiny and, contrib and contribution to these issues are all that has been recognised by the Government. 
The nominees were asked about any other roles or connections they have which may give rise to or be perceived as giving rise to potential conflicts of interest. None of the nominees identified any such conflicts. However, some members of the committee expressed concern about members of the Commission also being members of the Council of Economic Advisers. And Gavin Brown has raised those matters through his amendment in his speech today. And other members may also explain any concerns they have to the Chamber. However, I would like to emphasise the view that was shared by the committee that all three nominees have the relevant professional expertise and competence to enable the Commission to fulfil its role. Presiding officer, a recommendation as set out in the report we published last week is that the nominees should be appointed. With regard to Professor Leith, all members of the committee supported his appointment. The appointment of Lady Rice and Professor Hughes Hallett was supported by a majority of members on the committee. In closing, members will have picked up from my remarks that there is still work to be done in establishing the Scottish Fiscal Commission, including important issues that will help to build the credibility of the Commission's role. The committee looks forward to engaging with the Commission and the Government as this process continues. Many thanks. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm. Four minutes, please. Thank you, officer. I also welcome the, appointment, the creation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and I am very pleased that the Finance Committee and Parliament have a role in deciding who should sit on it, which, of course, is different from the um, Council of Economic Advisers, where the First Minister appoints. And I think that emphasises uh, the, the, the degree of hard and formal independence that is required of the um, uh, Fiscal Commission. The Finance Committee emphasised the importance of the OECD principles of independence, uh, non-partisanship and transparency and also of course emphasize that uh, it must be seen to be these principles must be seen uh, to be being observed in relation to the fiscal commission without that the public can have no confidence in the research or the findings of the commission now in view of that i think the government should surely be alarmed at the number of people including distinguished economists who are unhappy about people sitting on both the Fiscal Commission and the Council of Economic Advisers. And that's irrespective of the merits uh, of the individuals uh, involved. Um, uh, for example, um, 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 Bill Jameson, in an article which has been uh, widely read, said, does it not smack a little of, hunting with the, uh, of running with the hare and hunting with the hounds? So I think many people, including uh, members on this side of the House, have come to the conclusion that uh, the Fiscal Commission should not just be independent of government, but independent of both government and Council of Economic Advisers. Now, for me, the central mystery uh, of this whole uh, debate and this situation is why the Cabinet Secretary thought it was necessary to appoint two people from the Council of Economic uh, Advisers uh, and thus mired the Fiscal Commission in controversy from the very start. He himself has admitted that there are dozens of eligible and distinguished uh, people who could have served and uh, Professor Bell springs to mind, Professor Ashcroft springs to mind, Jeremy Peat uh, springs to mind. And there is a suspicion, and I won't put it stronger than this, that the government is more comfortable uh, with economists who perhaps have a closer relationship with their own position. Now, the Fiscal Commission will provide independent scrutiny of revenue projections and assess uh, the economic forces underlying receipts, as the Cabinet Secretary reminded us, and that initial role uh, will uh, expand. Expand, And I believe that now and certainly in the near future, it will be impossible to have the hard separation that the Cabinet Secretary suggests between their work and the work of the, uh, the Council of Economic uh, Advisers. Um, the Cabinet Secretary said uh, in committee that um, there were no, no occasions when advice uh, had been offered in relation to taxes by the Commission of Economic Advisers. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but in a way it's quite a surprising statement because you would think that advice on fiscal levers and policies is bound to come up in the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the uh, Council of Economic uh, Advisers and also the consequences of certain taxation decisions. So if they haven't come up yet, they will uh, come up uh, soon. Uh, in committee, the Cabinet Secretary offered to exclude certain areas from the remit uh, of the Council, which I think is a tacit admission that these uh, overlaps could certainly uh, emerge. Um, today, the Cabinet Secretary said that the individuals have a multiplicity of different functions, but only two that relate directly to Scottish economic and financial policy. And there we have the conflict that Gavin Brown emphasised between the advisory and the scrutiny roles. While the Cabinet Secretary seems oblivious of this uh, potential conflict, 
Susan Rice, to her credit in committee, was not oblivious, but said that she was aware of the possibility, she would deal with it, and that her role on the Fiscal uh, Commission would take primacy. So she has made clear that she is willing to choose and that she would choose the Fiscal Commission role. I think Andrew Hughes-Hallett should also be asked to make a choice between that and the Council and Economic Advisers. If the amendment is rejected today, then the Fiscal Commission will get off to the worst possible start, mired in controversy, and without the standing and credit with the public that are central to the very concept of an independent fiscal commission. Many thanks. We now turn to short open debate. Um, speeches of four minutes, please. Tavish Scott to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, many SNP members care about the perception of conflict of interest in politics and government. Certainly in the 1999 to 2007 Parliament, the SNP rightly held government to account on exactly that issue. And indeed, Mr Swinney often led that charge. And I might even say he often had a point. Gavin Brown's sensible amendment identified the core problem in this government's approach to these appointments. Now, I admire Susan uh, Rice. I would certainly appoint her too, were I in uh, the Cabinet Secretary's position. But in passing, of course, such appointments are entirely devolved. So this government could have appointed two women and a man, or even three eminent financial uh, experts who are female. Had they done so, then the balance of women versus men appointed to public positions would have improved. Uh, sadly, that won't be the case this afternoon. I don't know the other nominees, but from what I read, I would share the assessment made by Gavin Brown and Malcolm Chisholm that they are eminently qualified. But that, surely, presiding officer, is not the point. Members of the Commission should not be advising the government on economic policy on one hand and scrutinising government forecasts on the other. That, by any realistic interpretation, creates a perception of a conflict of interest. Now, I'm disappointed not just by that, but also by the Commission's remit and resources. Scotland has a highly centralised financial state, and that is one reason why I've certainly argued for a tartan office of budget responsibility. The UK government got this right. They divorced economic and financial forecasting, which can be manipulated by politicians, from central government. They established an OBR. That is not a friend of any UK Chancellor. It's not meant to be. The OBR provides an independent assessment of the nation's books for the government, but also for all representatives, for policy makers, for you and I. No such emphatic independent assessment is made of the Scottish Government's financial performance. Scotland needs that approach. We need to judge how best to spend taxpayers' money. Consider free personal care for the elderly. It is not affordable in its current form, say some who have studied the finances. That is not the case, say the Scottish Government. Instead of that kind of rhetoric, should not decision-making by ministers and parliament be based on fact? A tartan OBR would provide that fact unadorned by political spin and ma manipulation. When Scotland gets past the referendum in the autumn, I would rather Parliament again look not just at the appointments, but the, at the limited, narrow and restricted remit of the Commission. I welcome Mr Swinney's earlier remarks that he will review the remit in future. Robert Choate, the boss of the OBR, is by any standards an informative commentator. We should want the same or indeed better for Scotland. The Finance Secretary says he does not want the Commission to step on anyone's toes, but many outside suspect he's thinking only about his own feet. I struggle too with the Government's argument that the Commission has such a limited role and therefore can be lightly staffed through university with a negligible budget. Yet Revenue Scotland is being set up with all the panoply of law, with resources, with civil servants, and it is there to administer just a number of taxes. The contrast does appear striking. This Parliament has not got financial scrutiny of any government right, not just in the past seven years, but since 1999. It is an area ripe for reform. This was a real opportunity to create a body to deliver scrutiny and accountability across the nation's finances. A future Scotland, a future Scottish Government can do so much better, can believe in healthy, robust, independent checks and balances. That's an approach I would be pleased to support. And I too would urge the Finance Secretary to reconsider, to beef up his proposals and to make his appointments ones that we could all support on a cross-party basis where no potential conflict of interest would occur. Many thanks. And I now call on Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Last week we debated the changes to the written agreement between uh, the Finance Committee and the Scottish Government to the budget process, which is of course necessary due to the two uh, devolved uh, taxes, which will be an important part of uh, budget setting and budget uh, scrutiny. The Scottish Government will of course be uh, publishing its forecast for the revenue raised by these newly uh, devolved taxes. So it's vital that we have a body uh, providing scrutiny 
of uh, these forecasts, and of course that is the role of the Fiscal Commission we debate today. And this role will only be uh, fulfilled as well as its personnel allows for. In this regard, I want to uh, endorse the Cabinet Secretary's three uh, nominees. Susan Rice, as a prospective chair, has uh, worked in a range of senior uh, roles in the banking sector since 1986. Before that, uh, in academic management in America, she is currently a non-executive director of the Bank of England Court and a range of other uh, work uh, as well. And in uh, the evidence session at the Finance Committee, I was very struck by the depth of her commitment to concepts of uh, public service, something uh, too many overlook or are quick to uh, dismiss uh, all too often in a seemingly cynical age. I believe that she is committed to the Commission for uh, the best of reasons, and I believe she would be a, a, an effective, uh, will be an effective and engaging uh, chairperson. And Andrew Hughes, Hallett uh, and Campbell Leith, we have two uh, eminent uh, economists with uh, different uh, 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 but complementary uh, backgrounds. Both will be excellent appointments to uh, work with Susan Rice on uh, the Fiscal Commission. Can I say, uh, President, I consider it unfortunate some believe there is a conflict of interest for uh, two nominees by virtue of their uh, role in the Council of Economic Advisers. I do not uh, consider this uh, to be the case. Firstly, I would observe that the uh, Finance Committee took uh, considerable time to prepare a report on the establishment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Nowhere did we rec make a recommendation about restrictions on who could be appointed uh, by virtue of their membership of another entity. Secondly, I uh, believe that in the evidence they gave to the committee, all three nominees not only gave an undertaking that they would act independently, they actually demanded that their independence be respected. I believe we should take that on good faith. Uh, thirdly, uh, I would recognise that by virtue of their expertise, all three nominees are bound to be in demand to sit on other bodies. The perception for a conflict of interest might always be there, but that does not mean uh, in actuality there is one. I would also recognise the very different roles of the Fiscal Commission and the Council of Economic Advisers. I thought Malcolm Chisholm uh, slightly misinterpreted what the Cabinet Secretary, and I am sure he will speak for himself at the end, when he suggested that the Cabinet Secretary had offered to restrict uh, the, roles of, uh, the, the role of the Fiscal Commission. I think the point he was making is that he has already done that by virtue of uh, the recommendations made by the Finance Committee and its uh, uh, report on the Commission. So again, I do not believe there is a conflict between these uh, two uh, bodies. I would also further recognise that uh, all the nominees will serve for a, a single term. They will not be uh, beholden uh, on the decision of uh, the Cabinet Secretary to be reappointed thereafter. I think that further uh, 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 emphasises and reinforces their independence of operation. And also, I think we should recognise uh, that the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board some of the concerns expressed by some of uh, the members on uh, the committee about the issue of a, a potential uh, or a perceived conflict of interest, where he is uh, now saying that the Fiscal Commission members are going to be subject to a code of conduct which deals with registering interests and conflicts of uh, interest as they arise. So, for these reasons, I do not believe there is a, a, conflict, uh, a conflict of interest in these circumstances, and also the excellent nature of uh, the nominees before us. I believe we should back the creation of this uh, Commission and the nominees before us. Thank you very much, President mm -hmm. Officer. Uh, I now call Don Sunny, Cabinet Secretary, uh, to five o'clock at five o'clock, and I'd be obliged. Yeah. Yeah, right, President Officer, uh, delighted to uh, conclude the debate this afternoon, which I think has been a helpful debate. The first thing I want to say is that um, I think Mr Brown has done us a service today by producing an amendment which actually addresses and communicates the nub of the issue that he has here. Often we have amendments here which are used as, um, let me say, cover for other comments. But Mr Brown has put forward an amendment today which fairly sums up the issues that he has marshalled. He has fairly set out the credibility of the candidates that I have suggested for nomination. He has um, uh, uh, remarked on the, uh, the strength of those candidates and has focused the issue on his concerns about the perception of a conflict of interest with membership of the Council of Economic Advisers. And I think that's helpful because it does crystallise the debate so there can be no doubt about any other issues. There are four points I'd like to make to Parliament, Presiding Officer, which I think uh, capture why Parliament should be assured of the, that the correct thing to do is to support the motion in my name at decision time. The first is that the Government has put forward, and I have nominated, three candidates of eminent capability with a breadth of experience and a demonstrable reputation of integrity and challenge in all of the work that they have undertaken. And I do not think any of that 
is disputed by anybody in Parliament today. And indeed, uh, Mr Brown has made that point very clear in his comments today. Mr McMahon made it very clear in the comments he made to the Finance Committee last week. So we have candidates of undisputed capability and uh, of strength of reputation to be uh, candidates for this office. Of course. Malcolm, to some I certainly don't disagree with what you said, but, but I'm still genuinely puzzled, with all due respect to those individuals and their great abilities. There are, I think yourself admitted, dozens, certainly a large number of equally eminent economists. So I, I'm genuinely puzzled why they were overlooked in order to create this controversy. Cabinet Secretary. But w w without going through all sorts of names of individuals involved, what I can say to Mr Chisholm is that I don't think anybody comes along uh, to be potential candidates for such a role without uncomplicated connections to other areas of work that they may be involved in. But all of them uh, protect their integrity and their reputation for independence by the way in which they conduct themselves in exercising their responsibilities. And that is the strength of the three candidates that I've put forward today. The second point, if Mr Harvey will allow me to make some progress, I'll try and let him in in a moment. On the second point, is, about, is really a point of disagreement I have with Tavish Scott. I decided that the Scottish Fiscal Commission should have a very focused remit looking only to challenge the fiscal forecast that we made in relation to these taxes. I accept there is a different view that could be taken, a much broader role. I was very clear with the Finance Committee, and I think if I read the Finance Committee's report correctly, I am in tune with the Finance Committee on this point, that they wanted the body that I was suggesting and not the one with respect that Mr Scott was suggesting, however valuable that might be. So the focused remit is absolutely crucial. And the Fiscal Commission will have the exclusive responsibility to challenge the fiscal forecasts of the Government, and there will be no opportunity for the Council of Economic Advisers at any other stage to intervene in that process. The third is the location of the Fiscal Commission in the University of Glasgow, with independent support away from government, and I've been quite clear, and again this addresses Mr Scott's point, if there are resourcing issues, I will address those issues to the satisfaction of the Commission. And fourthly, the individuals have been appointed for one single term only. They will be free to say what they like about my fiscal forecasts. They will be able to challenge them in any way that they would like to do so, without fear of reappointment. I'll give way to Mr Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful. The existence of the Council of Economic Advisers implies that the Government will, from time to time, accept their economic advice. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how he would bring real objectivity to the task of scrutinising the impact uh, and the potential future consequences of economic policies which were, in part, at least partly, the result of his own advice? How can that be done objectively? Well, that's, that, that's, that's what Parliament's here to do, to challenge the, the view and the, the decisions that I take on issues in relation with the, the, the economy. In relation to the fiscal forecast that I make in relation to the budget, I'm absolutely crystal clear that the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Fiscal Commission alone has the power and the opportunity and the resources to challenge the fiscal forecast that I make and to make them in the interests of good public scrutiny in Scotland. So, presiding officer, the government has put forward three candidates of eminent capability. Their appointment has been endorsed by the Finance Committee. I invite Parliament to support those nominations today and to ensure that we have a fiscal commission that can properly, fully and effectively hold the government's forecast to account and ensure that the public debate in Scotland on this aspect of our budget process is enhanced as a consequence. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the appointments to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10356 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the membership of the Regional Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Question this motion will be put decision time to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 10427 in the name of Keith Brown on support for armed forces and veteran communities in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10430.2 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 10430 in the name of John Swinney on appointments to Scottish Fiscal Commission be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote are amendment number 10430.2 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 52. No, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10430 in the name of John Swinney on appointments to the Scottish Fiscal Commission be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10430 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 65. No, 50. There were two abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10356 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on membership of the Regional Chamber of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.